Hey, uh, normally don't start videos off like this, but this one's a little bit s special. Not because it's stupid, stupid long, but because certain things got said. Um, so monetization has never been something we truly cared about. Uh, we don't live off this, and even if we could live off this, we have no idea how long something like that would take. But there are some things that basically made us limited visibility that will not be said in this censored version of the episode. So I want to let you guys know right now, if you have any interest in seeing the uncensored version, which is shorter than this because it was really only one person, Honeybee, who got us to that point where, well, we could potentially be unlisted or limited, you know, engagement. Uh, <laughs> please feel free to, you know, hit whatever button you see on screen or do whatever content paywall thing you need to do to get to it uh i don't know if you guys even have an interest in things like this personally we've always been in a situation where we are well aware especially me that most of the people who subscribe and view the channel don't actually comment on the comment boxes in the fucking video they text me and email me directly because the few people that do have comments or want to say things are usually people i know personally who were nice enough to you know subscribe to the boy uh however honestly i don't know what to do with it but honeybee said hey make it a you know secondary separate video so i'm gonna do that um i don't foresee any money being made off it but if you really want to hear some raunchy and fucked up shit or just me being disturbed by honeybee um <laughs> yeah go ahead and do that personally i want to let everyone know who's listening to this video though you may be better off putting the playback speed to 1.25 or 1.5. I really recommend 1.25. Hello, welcome to another exciting episode of Token Podcast. I'm your host and sometimes referee, the friendly neighborhood, Zach Stat Pearson. And today I'm joined by he who has traveled amongst the stars and has frequent flyer miles, a one Jupiter exile. Hey, thanks for having me. You can find me on YouTube at youtube.com slash at Jupiter Exile. Always a pleasure to have you. Always enjoy having you on the channel. And here comes a new challenger, uh, one of many on this special edition Baldur's Gate 3 podcast episode. Uh, he who swagging knows no bounds, but we still have to try a one Bilbo Swaggins. Uh, Mr. Swaggins, you want to tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yes, sir. Thank you for having me, first off. But, uh, yeah, I'm Bilbo Swaggins. Uh, I'm kind of a good friend of Mr. Uh, Zach's here. It's been a long time since we've had a chat, but other than that, I don't, I don't currently have any handles I'm going by right now other than Bilbo Swaggins. Just play a few games here and there. But, yep, that'd be all for now. All right, and for our next guest on the Baldur's Gate 3 Electric Boogaloo Part 2, um, we have a one honeybee whom, well, to say that they have a Dungeons and Dragons addiction would be like saying Kanye West has an addiction to being an asshole. I have 184 sets of dice. You're joking, right? I'm not. The fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> so many things, um, but they are mostly gifts. It's an easy thing for friends and family to give me. They don't ever have to ask what I want for Christmas or birthdays. You you better stay away from C2E2. <laughs> I don't think I... Well, I mean, this is before I knew who you were. There was a dice seller. But he had a dice. That was a bunch of other dice. Oh, I believe it. Put into a mold of a dice. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But then it actually had, like, the numbers and shit on it. It was, uh -huh. like, 15 pounds and bigger than my hand. I believe it. For scale, I believe it. my hand is bigger than your whole entire head. I crossed the Canadian border from Canada back to America after a con with an entire backpack full of dice. And I got stopped by TSA the because fuck? they didn't like the way it jingled. And the guy looked like he was about to catch me for something. He opens it up, sees all the dice. He looks so fucking disappointed. And he just hands it back to me. He's just like, just go. Just go. I'm like, yeah, that's... That's accurate. I hope I make friends with that guy one day. <laughs> the poor TSA agent. He was so sure he got me for something. That guy sounds no, like me. 
every single time women with no fucking shirts on would come through the airport. I swear to God. Why do they always say the same dumbass line? Oh, I don't actually have a top on. Is that bad? The fuck you think? What? Yes, that was an actual thing that kept happening to me. Okay. Oh, that's, that's right. Yeah, you didn't know I used to work at TSA. Yeah. yeah, you told me. Oh, yeah. I just yeah. didn't think that would be a common enough thing. What the fuck? Bro, bro, they will wear a hoodie. And a pullover hoodie and a bra and act like they don't know they gonna get searched but now they've just guaranteed it has to be worse than normal listen even if you aren't straight a lot of the women that work at tsa are in fact heterosexual so you know what happens enhanced screening which means you got to get pulled off the fucking line you got to go to a private area which ain't all that private because it's an airport there are cameras everywhere but it's for your safety and the agent's safety we all know that and then they yeah. have to basically fill you up in ways they don't fucking want to because you didn't want to put on a goddamn shirt going to an airport. So weird. Anyway, That's though. That's the nicest way you can put it. All right, Honeybee, tell us how you feel about the story opening. Um. Oh, is that the first question? You gonna ask me. And you the one who wrote these? Well, it says, uh, the first question was, um, was I familiar with the mechanics of D&D 5e? And based on everything you just said, you know, I don't need to ask you that. Okay, that's fair. Valid, actually. Um, <laughs> very familiar with 5e. Um, but as far as the story opening goes, um, I think it was actually quite brilliant. It throws you into it. It gets you interested right away. You know, you get a sense of danger, you get a sense of urgency, and then you are just like thrown into this world with no idea what's really going on. Um, and you can play uh, the uh, Dark Urge playthrough and then you really have no idea what's going on um, because you're playing a character that essentially has no memory. Um, you can also play, you know, the origin characters, of course, and they have their own thing. But um, yeah, starting off with like your character getting that Mind Flayer Parasite and realizing, oh no, I only have like 24 hours or whatever to get this thing out of my head. It really lights a fire under your ass. So it's 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 very good. It's a very good way to It's it's a very good way to start things out, introduce you to the world at large and get get you moving. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Also the cinematics just gorgeous. I have a lot of feelings about this game. <laughs> yeah, I kind of figured as much. Um, yes. Okay, well, with that being said, speaking of characters, uh, why don't you next tell me who your favorite origin character is? Or characters, plural. So, I want to say Astarian, because everyone loves Astarian. He's sarcastic. He's funny he's cool and just to you know, be clear he's... that's that lame ass vampire with the white hair i right? love that that vampire is the funniest character in the game he had me cracking up the entire time but my favorite character is actually the wizard i liked gail gotcha. um yeah gail was my absolute favorite he's a nerd he's everything you think a wizard is supposed to be but he's also like he's very sweet very insecure and you get this sense from him that ju just talking to him that he's not really appreciated for who he is as a person he's appreciated for what he can do um and and i i really like the subtleties with that a lot of people are really mean to this character in particular because yes he talks about his ex a lot you they have to realize uh his ex is literally the goddess of the thing that he is the most passionate about Literally the goddess that he worships, so yes, he has to talk about wait, her. Wait, 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 what? What is she the goddess of? The goddess of magic. He's a wizard. Magic is his thing. Yeah, he, he fucked the goddess of magic. I and think he'd get along like, well with Sokka. Yeah, and, and people are like, people, <laughs> he fucked the moon. Um, and people are like, oh, he's, he's got no, he's got no game. Did the dude fucked a goddess. Of magic of magic oh he's so hung up on his ex you're still hung up on your ex and he's just some dude who
who doesn't like take who doesn't wear deodorant and can't use a t- fucking top sheet on his bed. Damn. Like, shut the fuck up. Damn. I feel what? like you speaking from personal experience. <laughs> I am. They're like, oh, he's not over his ex. Yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> he's he's he he doesn't. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you romance this guy, which I guess will lead us to a different question, but. Vaguely, if you romance him, he chooses you over his goddess. Like, how flattering is that? That sounds depressing. I would rather try to steal his ex. Oh, his ex sucks. She's the goddess of magic. I mean... She tells him to kill himself. Oh, wow. Well, shit. It's fuck fucked that up. Bitch. That is... Yeah, fuck wow. that bitch. This game yeah. is so dark. Yeah, no, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Mistra straight up sucks. I would fist fight her. I'd lose, but I'd still fist fight her if the game allowed me to. Just cheat. <laughs> Use a knife or a taser. <laughs> right. But yeah, that's my favorite character. Um, very unpopular opinion there, but I absolutely love him. Um, I, again, I like Astarian. He's very funny. He's very funny. I'm not thirsting for him like everyone else. He's very funny. And his story is actually quite compelling once you get to know him past the like horny vampire thing you know um i'm I'm not gonna like try to talk too long but like his thing is he is a i mean basically okay he's basically a sexual assault survivor you know he was used to lure people he was he, he just basically a pawn. So that's all he knows how to do. And he's ma- trying to manipulate your character at the beginning. Because that's all he knows. And as you go through and he starts to, like, understand that he is allowed to think and do things for himself. He becomes a lot more interesting. And you he... he <laughs> I, everyone's all like, oh, you know, I can change him, I can change him. With his character, you can actually change him. Oh yeah. my god, you remind me of so many, <laughs> they act like they don't think that they're still in high school, 30-year-old women. I can fix him. I'm just like, listen to what you just said, okay? Well, that's the thing, that's the thing. With him, I'm not going to say, like, in a real relationship you can fix him, don't try. With him, you can fix him, or you can make him worse. Here's how I look at the shit. Video games, okay. It's a given. Yeah. That was decided yeah. before you even bought the game if you could fix somebody. Real idiots, you gotta figure out where they are on the idiot versus ignorant scale. If they're 100% yeah. ignorant, why are you wasting your time? If they just yeah. stupid, 50-50. But that's just me. Yep. And then, of course, I'm gonna talk about Carlac really, really quick because she is, you know, one of my top three. I love every single character, but these are these are my three that I go to every single time. Um, she's just a delight. Her little idol ad- animation is doing like a funny little dance in the background. She's cute. She's funny. She's like excitable. And oh my, I love her so much. Anyway, that's well. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting way of phrasing that <laughs> yeah. all right uh what was your favorite team to kick ass with okay so my go-to team of course i had gail and i had i had my tav my 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 character um i kept a starry in um mostly because his dialogue is hilarious his dialogue options are so funny was he incredibly useful not really but I, I liked his his snarky little quips. They made me laugh every time. Um, and I would either have Lazelle or Carlac, kind of depending what I you know what I was going for and how just how I was feeling that day. You need a character that has the muscle, just in general. Um, I would occasionally switch them out for Shadowheart, but not that often. I do like Shadowheart. I think she's a really interesting character, but I really only brought her out for like the Temple of Shar and all of that. Anything that had to do with um with Shar. That's that's when I would bring her out. But yeah, um that was kind of my go-to team. I always had Gale, always had a Starian. Everyone else was kind of switched out there. 
Damn. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you got a preference. By the way, I'm curious. Um, do they auto scale the level, or do they stay the same unless you use them? Oh no no no! They auto scale. See, that's what so, they fucked up because now they've decentivized people experimenting. Yeah, but it would be it would be really hard later on if you wanted to try out a different character if you just didn't think like, oh, in this area that this character won't be useful, and that area could be hours of the game, you know. So you put you send them back to camp, use someone else, and then everyone levels up. Well, now the character back in camp is basically useless for the rest of the game if they did that. Because leveling up does not happen often. You can you max out level at 12. There's only so much XP you can get in that game. So it would, it would be very difficult to go back and try to level someone up if you all just didn't level up at the same time. I have so many questions I'd love to ask them about why they chose such a low level, but eh. Um, uh, it's because, like, the later classes do get a little too powerful. You have spells that would be impossible to translate in a game like that. Because you can do it in a, you know, a tabletop game where you can kind of use your imagination. Like, there's a spell called Wish, which is exactly what it sounds like. You can wish for something. Imagine trying to program that into a game. You couldn't. So, uh, 12, 12 was... Just as far as spells go, at least, and abilities, uh, probably the wisest place to cap it off. I'm almost scared to ask, but I'm eternally curious. What happens when you use the wish command? Uh, okay, so with the wish spell, it's really up to uh, DM's discretion. And there is a 30% chance that you will never be able to cast it, uh, cast it again. But, I mean, if your DM is fun... They'll let you do whatever the fuck you want. I mean, they can make it into like a monkey's paw situation where you have to be like super, super, super specific. Well, um, I meant like in Baldur's Gate 3, or is that not an option? Oh, it's not an option. There is a character Damn. who does cast the wish spell or can if you fuck with her enough. And Good she can. Way fuck with or bad way fuck with? Oh, bad, bad. Um, if you're just kind of, if you're just kind of like, well, oh, what, what can she really do? If she's just kind of like, okay, well, um, I wish you to end. And then it's just a game over. Damn, that is some <laughs> yeah. Final Fantasy VIII shit right there. <laughs> it was fucking nuts. That also um, just made no sense to me. Side note, the strongest character in Final Fantasy VIII was a character that no one took seriously and everyone thought was a lame. And she was the female equivalent of a fucking simp. For what was basically a slutty ass version of Gambit. And that's saying something because it's Gambit. <laughs> and her limit break has an attack called the end. And the game will kill anything in the game if you use it. Including the final boss and all secret bosses. That's crazy actually. Yeah uh, eight I, is, I don't trust eight is... any little white girl who uses nunchucks. Brings nunchucks to a gunfight. With the ability to literally wipe out anything from existence. That shit terrified me. Everyone else yeah. thought it was funny. I didn't. Yeah. I've never actually played eight. That is you like didn't miss one much. of the that is one of the few that I didn't play. No oh, one and will ever hold that against you. I promise. Yeah, that's kind of what I heard. <laughs> that's why I didn't bother. They they broke their own game system so ridiculously hard that you can literally do the cap damage if you play your cards right with very little grinding before you hit level 30. Mm. Eight-year-old me figured this out or nine-year-old me figured this out. I actually got so sad at how easy the game was, I went back to seven. <laughs> like, I wish there was a joke in there, but no. No. All right, Um. moving on. Uh... Oh, wait, we did romance, right? No, no. Oh, no, we didn't. shit, here we go. Let me make sure I got a cushion on my seat. What is your favorite romance? So, Don't this make a is caught actually... in a bad romance pun, please. <laughs> I won't, I won't. This is actually kind of a tough question for me, believe it or not, because the way romance works, um, there's so many branching paths that you can really take with this. Um, the first one that I did is kind of my comfort um, relationship in this game and that of course was Gale 
Um, and I really appreciated it because as it goes on, he keeps trying to like impress you with his magic because that's all he knows. That's all anyone's valued him for. Um, and you can either like fall for it and be like, oh yeah, wow, you're so magical, Gail. Or you can be like, hey, stop with the illusion. Stop with all this magic shit. I'm, I like you for you as a person. And he does really appreciate that. Um, and I thought it was really sweet. He had some of the most, like, genuine, heartfelt, and un romantic scenes. Um, I think he's the only one that, like, his his relationship with you actually ends with, like, a marriage proposal. It's quite cute. Um, I especially liked how much of, like, a just nice dude he was. And, and I don't mean, like, a, oh, he's a nice guy, you know? But like, I'm glad genuine... you clarified because I was about yeah, to yeah. ask. No, no, no. Like an actual, an, a nice dude. He likes, he talks about his mom. He wants to introduce you to his mom. He knows how to cook. Uh, he is, he is in canon, the camp cook. Like he can cook. He talks about his library, his cat. He, you get to know him as a person and he really is just a lovable dork. Um, so I think he was my favorite. Also, he looks a lot like my husband, so that, that was just major points for him. Um, I, a lot of people go for Astarian, and Astarian does have some really beautiful romance moments, but my first time around, like, he, you know, did the whole confession thing to me, and I was just kind of like, well, it sounds to me like you need a friend. And he actually appreciated that more, I think, um... So I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, every other character, if you turn them down, they're like, ooh, I'm sad. But he was just kind of like, wow, a friend. I've never had a friend. That's amazing. He was so happy about it. Um, so it sounds crazy, but with Astarian, um, more often than not, I friend zone him because he likes being put in the friend zone. <laughs> um, and Lazal had a really, really cute romance too because she's a character that is just she's mean right off the bat she's she's very intense she's <laughs> and she's from like this like warrior clan you know she is she doesn't really like do the love thing until you get to know her more and you find her softer side so her romance was also very interesting for that because you get to know her as it goes but again, just to summarize, Gail, a hundred percent Gail. I just like how you talked up all those other people, and then at the end you go, "Nah, fuck it, Gail." Every romance in that game, though, and I guess this is going to lead into the next question: How do I think Larian handled relationships in the game? Every romance is handled so well. And you get it's ironic that you say that, but I'll wait till you're done. <laughs> Why is it ironic? I'll wait till you're done so it's funnier for me. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> every every relationship is handled so well and with such care. Um, a lot of them do start out as like a purely physical thing because you have to understand they all think they are dying. Every character in your party thinks they have like a um an hourglass that they're just watching like run out they think their life is about to end so of course they're just, what do you do when you think you're about to die you you get down and dirty with like the first person you see really right um but as it goes on that I'm becomes less so of a thing well that's human nature i mean, I mean honestly i'm still straight i'm not gonna go hey i got cancer let me fuck your ass bro well, no, no, but I'm just, I'm just saying. Um, and every character is romanceable by any gender. Um, and that just feels like a purely D&D thing, honestly. Um, I can't tell you how many, like, straight dudes I have played D&D &D with, but, like, they're like, ooh, that hot barkeep NPC over there. Like, oh, you mean Dave? Yeah, Dave. I'm gonna, I'm gonna flirt with Dave. Like, <laughs> The straightest dude you'll ever meet, and and they'll 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 fuck the the male tiefling barkeep. Um. <laughs> um. So yeah, no, I I really liked with it that uh, Larian handled 
um, relationships in the game. As it goes on, it becomes more emotional and less physical. Um, which, I mean, <laughs> most relationships go that way. With time, you get to know each other, you open up, you become more comfortable with a person, and it becomes less about the physical and more about the deeper emotional connection that you have. I thought it was really, it was really fun getting to know these characters as the game progressed. You finished? Yeah. So they mm -hmm. fucked up with the intro system so bad that they basically had to patch it out because they made all the characters thirst for whoever the main playable character is. Okay. Yeah, that was a bug at the beginning. Yeah, um, yeah, which is still fun to put that at the end of everything you yeah, just said. Yeah, yeah. That kind of sucked because it made everyone like, oh, Gail just, he, he just wants to fuck everyone, meh. Which was not the case for him. He was just the buggiest one out of them, unfortunately. Um, now that they've patched it, like, people are starting to, like, come around on that, I think. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, you phrased uh, it that way on purpose. I Don't phrased it that lie. way on purpose. You know I did. Man, see, here's I, what I'm. I don't. I'm not annoyed that it happens. I'm more like annoyed when people don't fucking believe me. Okay, so we had the debut video of "She Who Shall Not Be Named." Um, I had the whiteboard up, and we was all getting along. And I just said before anything happens, I was like, I don't know what it is, but I automatically know if there is a drawing surface anywhere and the ratio of male to female leans female, I should tell people, hey, don't draw a fucking penis. It's like a reflex. I've yet to regret that reflex. But here's the thing. Somebody wrote on the board, the whiteboard, this is not a penis. They just wrote those words, right? Video Ooh. fucking is only able to be partially monetized. Oh no. Then literally like another video like right before it or after it, it kept saying that this video is partially monetized because of something in it there was put it this way there, there was only two curse words used shit and fuck and it was less than 10 times right yeah i couldn't figure it out and then when i looked through the system it gave me like uh i couldn't figure out the exact point in time it happened but i tried re-uploading it and i shit you not I think it got triggered by the word black men. Then I just made a stupid little video on shorts where I just said black men, black men, black men, like, you know, like Bloody Mary shit from when we was little. Yeah, yeah, Shout yeah. outs to the people who remember Bloody Mary. Good way to scare your younger siblings. Oh, um, yeah. Fucking right. And I'm just like, that video is not allowed to have monetization. That video was like 15 seconds. So I tell this to people, both stories, no one fucking believes me. FD Signer. One of the only, for lack of better terms, social political pundits on YouTube and Nebula who is African American descent and is actually unbiased, right? He says it happened to him. And then every and then and, and, and then I show this to people, then they want to fucking believe me. Ain't that some shit? <laughs> Then again, being the boy Jesus who cried Christ. wolf while being a minority is just like saying the sky is blue, I guess. Yeah. Oh, Don't get me I wrong. Wanted Technically, to... oh. he bitched about it and they fixed it, but I'm still salty just that no one in my own camp fucking believe me. Yeah. I do want to, um, real quick, real quick, I want to elaborate on, like, the last question because something else just kind of popped into my head. Oh, gee, I um, wonder what that is. Well, actually, it, it, as far as relationships go, it, it's not even just the romantic relationships that I think they handled really well. It's friendships that I think they also handled really well. There's fun cool. little interactions that you see between the characters. And as the game progresses, as you're like walking along, they'll have conversations with each other. And you can see the characters becoming more comfortable, not just with like your your Tav, your, your main character, but with each other, too. And I think that's really fun how that progresses, too. Anyway, sorry. No, 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 it's fine. Like I said, I mean, it goes yeah. without saying this episode is basically 100% you. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, with that being said, uh, how do you feel about the story as a whole? Not one in particular part, the collective whole. 
As a whole, I think it has one of the most <clears throat> one of the most compelling stories that I have, you know, honestly played through in a game. It was it was complex. It it was it was deep. It was it made me question a lot about myself and the way that I think about games. And and, and the way that I think about myself. It made it made me the like fuck? have to like it made me have to like look in the mirror. <laughs> After a few, after a few, like, choices that I've had to make and go, like, am I a bad person? What the- I mean, well, I wouldn't say bad. Uh, I mean, you more, like, uh, I, I hate to use a superhero comic book term. Not because I have a problem with, you know, superhero comic books, but some of their terms I hate just because I feel like they don't need to exist. Um, you're what I like to call chaotic good you lean somewhere at least from what i know about you you lean somewhere in a positive direction but you have absolutely no problem letting someone slip on a banana peel that but is you so true. also offer them ice or you know tell them to visit a doctor if they feel concussed after i finish laughing see that's yeah. that's exactly like chaotic <laughs> good energy yep yep um <laughs> Yeah, no, but there were there were scenes in that game and choices that had to be made that were actually difficult to make, um, and made me made me just like question myself and and question <laughs> um, my own morality. Um, I also really like that um, life is kind of this overarching theme in the game and i know that sounds so vague but like life and what you do with the time that you have that's that's something almost every single character has in common you are all basically racing towards death um <clears throat> every character thinks they are about to die or become something monstrous they all have to kind of very quickly come to terms with the fact that they are not going to live forever and may not live for very long. Um, almost every character has a moment where <laughs> they have to look at their their own hourglass, basically, and wonder how much time they have and what they're going to do with the time that they have. So I, I I found that really compelling. Questioned mortality is interesting to you. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I think questioned mortality, it's weird. I guess maybe it's because I'm not used to experiencing how it feels in video games. I know there are plenty of games with questioned mortality or mortality philosophy, but I never feel impacted unless it's in... A, like a movie or a documentary or just talking to a human being but i will say this now i know you don't know bilbo swaggins but he like many other people who were supposed to be in this particular recording session are people i knew from the military let me tell you how bad this guy had it day he from the day he got to basic to the day he left he had a drill sergeants or one particular drill sergeant literally tell him i am going to spend special amount of time with you because I hate that you're a pretty boy. So he turned into a fucking ball of rage. He did nothing wrong. Comes to AIT, which comes after BCT where I met him. And I, there was somebody there with him that said, man, I can't believe how calm he is. I was like, what's wrong? I was like, bro, he was getting fucked with every day by the drill sergeant just for being a pretty boy. And fucking, I'd have never seen him this relaxed. I was like, well, hey, I mean, I'm glad he's in a happier state. Now, he's a quiet guy. He's he's that fun guy in the room, but he's not fun until you interact with him. Everyone liked him pretty much, except for one piece of shit who won't be named. And he told me flat out, hey, man, I ugly cried like two or three different times in this game. I was like, what the fuck are they putting in this crack? That's the moment I was like, okay, I got to figure out when I can play this fucking game. Because that shit blows my mind. Oh, yeah, this, no. Fair. This is a grown-ass man who got it worse than most people can dream of getting it. 
in the fucking military in basic, didn't kill himself, not one time had to deal with a p asshole who had a personal vendetta against him for literally no reason other than he didn't care about who he stepped over to try to impress a sergeant at AIT. Fuck that guy, his name was Hector Camacho, yeah I said it. But here is this guy, and he just goes, dude I ugly cried. I was like, like two Ooh, or yeah. three times, I'm like what the fuck is in this game? There, there, like I said, there are some hard moments. There are, oh God, there, I, I had to like turn off my game for like hours and just like sit and like think about what just happened. I had to like, I had to come to terms with what just happened to these, these little, these silly pixel, uh, pixel dudes. Like, <laughs> ah, this, this game should like. It shouldn't affect you this way, but you become invested in these characters. You become invested in your own character, who is really just like your avatar, but they give you so many opportunities to develop what is basically a blank slate. And you do become attached. Like my first my first tab, my first playthrough. I still I still remember every decision that I made and every way that I developed that character, specifically. This game is insane, is what I'm saying. I'm, I'm gonna definitely have to try this out. I, this you is, have to. Well, I mean, I already play RPGs. Yeah. It's just... The, the description might... I get back from people, it's not just, bro, this is a good game, here's why. It's like, bro, I went someplace deep, I went someplace dark, I was not expecting that, and mm -hmm. I'm just like, Y'all talking like this is the second coming of Final Fantasy VII. I was uh, like, it is. It really is. Like, some of these characters, uh, they are going to be as iconic, I think, as 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 some of our most beloved I feel like there's definitely going to be some characters. Baldur's Gate 3 elements in the next Smash Bros. Let me say that. It, dude, I'm working on a fucking... I, I, in fact, I just finished two Baldur's Gate 3 cosplays. What the fuck? <laughs> Yeah, already. Wait, has this game even already. been out for a month? Yeah, it has. Oh, that's right. The the, the yeah. when it came out in on August. PC and PS5 yeah. is a month apart. Yes. Oh, oh yes, my yes, yes. god! What the fuck? Yeah. Well, I mean, if we bump into each other at a con, you want pictures? Let me know. Fuck yeah! I'm still not going to look at your Instagram because I'm not stupid. Um, <laughs> let me see. All right. Well, uh, what was your moral alignment for most of the game? So my first playthrough, I tried to do a pure, like, good boy run. I tried so hard. No, you didn't. You're not genetically designed to be a good boy. No, no, you know, I, I, I had a, I had this, like, idea in my mind. I was going to play my wizard. He was going to be, he was going to be the goodest good boy. He was basically just going to be, like, th this, this smart little puppy dog. He was, he was going to be the goodest good boy that ever was good. And it was so. Was playing Mass Effect. Here's the thing, here's the thing. It is so hard to make those choices in those in this game. Especially like once you get to act 3 especially, every choice is morally gray. There is no good or evil decision. There's just decisions. And and they all have upsides and they all have downsides and you're going to hurt somebody no matter what you do by that point. So it's very it's tough, and it, it was actually tough on me, like, emotionally, <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, even, like, Act 1, it was it was pretty easy to, they kind of ease you into the, um, like, the morality system. It's not even, like, really a system. There's just decisions. Um, some characters will like you more based on your decisions. Some people, some characters will like you less. Um, so you gotta kind of find a balance there. My second playthrough, I played a Dark Urge, which I don't so know if you know what that is. So I'm gonna need a bit of clarification is. on what that means, because right. I thought it just meant, hey, I'm gonna be an asshole renegade now. No, 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 no. It, it is a origin character that you can play, but you can customize their appearance is the thing. But it's a specific storyline. And basically... 
you have no memory, but you have these horrible urges to hurt people and do all these like awful, nasty things. And you can either lean into it or you can try to resist it as best as you can. Do you get anything for resisting it? Not really. <laughs> wow. That's, that's that's the fucked up part to me. I mean, you get your you get to keep your friendships, and I think, honest to God, um, being able to keep Gale in my party, who is out of control, powerful near the end of the game, like absurdly strong, um, near the end, I I think that was worth it for me. Um, but yeah, no, or you can, again, you could lean into it, but I think it's a less interesting story if you just go full, like, murder hobo. I think it's way more interesting if you try murder to resist- Murder hobo, what? <laughs> D&D term. It's, they it's have murder hobos in D&D? No, 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 no. It's, it's, um, it's a, it's a term for a character who's just kind of like, oh, I'm just going to kill everything, Ugh, you know? Which is a very boring way to play, and if this is how you play, I really would- I would never want to play with somebody who is like this. <laughs> boring! Um, but yeah, no, um, you could do that, or you can resist, and I feel like your character develops better that way. I mean, both- both outcomes are really interesting. It- it- you kind of dive a little deeper into certain parts of the lore, especially in Act 3. I'm not going to say any more about that because that is big spoiler territory. Yeah, I mean, no I assume... no one wants to tell me, but y'all keep making me curious. Because I want you to play it yourself. That's the thing. I want you to play through. First, first do your own character, Zax. I don't recommend doing a Dark Urge first play through. Do your own character. Make your own decisions. Learn the lore and the world first. And then go back and do a Dark Urge run. Look. All I know is I'm not trying to play that game solo. Okay. Also, somebody made a PC mod where you can actually see your fucking characters up close when it's not a cutscene. Yeah. Like you can roam in the world and actually see shit. I mm -hmm. was like, okay, well, that has literally eliminated every single possible reason I would not want to play this. I don't hate top down games. I hate the concept of top-down RPG combat yeah. put together. No, no, no. That I don't like. Ooh, you might miss something or you won't be able to see everything. It's like, okay, well, guess what? It's not permanent. I can still push the camera back. So mm -hmm. if I get the choice of being able to have both my camera having freedom of movement completely, I'm going to choose freedom of movement completely. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah. know why, but I'm. I really want to make... I want to make a fucking avatar, like, so bad. I want to make somebody who beats your ass, but they can do elemental magic through their hands. I don't know if that's possible, but I'm, that's my current goal. Uh, hmm. See, I know okay. you can fight, like, I have a monk class, and then you can have, like, yes. a sorcerer or mage as a backup class, but I mean, like... I want someone yep. who can throw out elemental damage without using a staff. Mm. Yeah, I know. I'm like fucked. I understand. Sorcerer. Probably what you'd be leading towards. Um, I like sorcerer. They're fun. I, I just like the, um, the utility of a wizard more. Being yeah. able to learn from spell scrolls is really, really fun and cool. Yeah, I think you in exile would... Y'all would fuck up this game completely, but I think you would be so fucking mad at Exile for being broken as fuck. He figured out a way to where you can dual wield staffs and you can utilize the game's most dangerous magic like back to back. And he found some accessory that allows you to like reduce casting times. So not only are you doing some of the most ridiculous spells, but you made it that much easier to do. Like, he straight up broke the fucking game because there was some way that you can use two staffs simultaneously. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I'm I gonna have to talk to him. You, yeah, yeah, I kind of wanted you two to discuss that at some point on or off the, the show. Um, all right, well, what uh, were the primary classes and race that you picked and played? So this is... uh. 
<laughs> Interesting question. Um, personally, I have always, almost always, played a dwarf in d and I did not do that this time. This time around, I went purely um, the most, what I thought was the most aesthetically pleasing, because I'm gonna have to look at this character the whole game through, and I'm gonna have to see him naked. <laughs> So I went, I went half elf because I thought the elves one looked ugly. The elf, <laughs> shut up, shut up. I, um, didn't, I didn't say anything. I don't know what the problem is. <laughs> um. Anyway, I thought the elf met because I, I, I always, I played a dude. I, every single playthrough I've done, no I played a man. Surprising um, no one. I know. And I thought the male elves were hideous. The male humans also fucking hideous. The male dwarves kind of boring, honestly. The male halflings kind of ugly. It was the male half elves that I thought looked, I think, the most aesthetically pleasing. <clears throat> so my first playthrough, I did a male half elf and a wizard class because. I like wizards, I like the utility, and I didn't know anything really about this game when I started. Um, I tried to stay as, like, spoiler-free about this game. I didn't do early access, I didn't do anything at all. I tried to stay away from every single spoiler that I could until it was I was able to buy the game. And I think I had a better experience that way. But because I chose wizard, I didn't realize there was already a wizard character, so we were just two wizards blowing shit up by the end of the game. I Which mean, was fine. Can't you change the class of the other characters at will? It depends on the playthrough that you do. Well, yeah, you just gotta have that Wilt or Wist guy at your camp, right? Oh, um, um, oh my god, what what is his name? Yes, yeah, the skeleton thing. I don't know. Yeah, the spe the skeleton man. I just call him Pop Pop. What the fuck? <laughs> I'm like Grandpa. What is this Arrested Development shit? <laughs> I'm just like, oh, it's great. His, Withers. His name was Withers. Withers, yeah. Yeah, that was okay, it. Doesn't he just um, change that shit for you? Yeah, you can. I just didn't want to because by then I was like, I had this like story in my head like, oh, okay, a wizard and he's romancing Gale and they're two wizards just being nerdy together and I loved that. <sighs> Second playthrough, I did a bard. Surprise and that... You make the Witcher. The bard is so overpowered i cannot express this enough and this was like my dark urge so i made him look like an emo boy um because i thought it was funny <laughs> he's like i'm just kind of like do you want to join my emo band like that was <laughs> that was in my brain when i designed him but um he was a, a half elf he was but half drow this time and it's really interesting um depending on your race how, how like other characters treat you npcs because people are racist as fuck to drows <laughs> they're mean um so that was really interesting but yeah bards are op as fuck in this game i barely had to fight because i could just talk my way out of every situation it was ridiculous. Um, so if you want an easy playthrough, Bard. That's actually... <laughs> that's actually not what I heard. Um, it is, I think, in intelligence, charisma on a super strength class. Because apparently most of the bosses in the game are humanoid. And you can literally, if you push them off a cliff, a ledge, in the water, or lava you automatically win. So there's yeah. a group of people who literally would have one character cloak everybody and then they would go up to whoever the boss is and they would literally just push them off a cliff or a ledge and then they just won the fight. And you then when they showed that. me this shit, I was laughing my ass off. Well, here's the thing. If you do that, you lose all of the loot. So what did I did... Did you win though? Here's, here's what I did. You Well, I mean, you get experience even if you don't fight. You talk your way out of it because Sounds that's like still a you... Yeah, you're still, you know, doing a thing. You're still doing something. Um, so you talk your way out of a fight, and then you have a starry and pick their pockets and take whatever loot you would have gotten from the fight anyway. Now, yeah, and then I saw this one thing where, well, uh, uh, Bilbo and Exile was talking about using barrels, but Bilbo figured something out. Hmm. Um, yeah. The, what is it, the... 
some container that changes everything into a spoon or something? Box of utility or something like that? Oh, oh my god, um, um... Yeah, well, he it's, put... It's, it's the chest of the mundane. Yes. He yes. put in a bunch of water barrels because water barrels are cheaper or easier to deal with than fire and explosives. So what he would do is he would wet up entire floors and rooms and then he would just have half the characters spray the ground with electricity and the other half spray with ice. So basically nothing could actually touch him because it was so easy to carry around like I think he said like 50 or 60 of those things. It yep. was ridiculous. I'm just like, that is hilarious. That sounds like something I would do. Yeah, you can do um, a similar thing with like um, like oil barrels and fire. Yeah, that's that's what, but he used water instead because, well, he could carry more of them and also they were cheaper to get and they were did more damage depending on their damage scaled up with the magical power of everyone else. Now, yeah. for me... What I thought was fucking cool was, uh, I think that it's a little bit too easy to make a Witcher in this game, but that's not going to stop me from trying. My main character is not going to be a Witcher, but somebody on my team is going to be a Witcher. Can All I confess you something to you? Who uses a sword and then they can cast magic without the use of a staff. Yeah, that sounds like a witcher to me. Oh, and you can see in the dark too. Yeah, again, um, that sounds like some witcher shit to me. Yeah, that was another reason why I went with um, Half Elf, the dark vision. It helps so much. Yeah, I mean, it it's doesn't called, seem like it's based off of Dungeons and Dragons. You're gonna yeah. need something to see in those dungeons. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm very sure this will be very hard for you. Uh, what specifically did you like best in the game besides the virtual penises? Okay, I mean, okay. I'm going to say, like, the character writing. Not even just the main characters, but the NPCs. The villains were compelling. I mean, I could see... I could, I could see both sides in a in a like fucked up kind of way. I could be I I could look at these villains and be like, okay, I could I could see what you were trying to do, but take a step back because you're like teetering on the edge of crazy. Um, and then some of the villains were just straight up like, what do you mean I can't just murder people? <laughs> of course I can just murder people. It's a murder cult, you know. Um, but. The, like, the characters, the NPCs, I became so attached to some of the tiefling, tiefling characters that, like, if one of them dies, I would just go back, reload it in old save, and play back up to that point well, just to save them. Well, I guess you know them. you feel about save scumming. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm pro-save scumming. Fuck you if you're angry about it. I don't care. I'm trying to enjoy this game, goddammit. Yeah, I don't understand... <laughs> Like it's this, this is something unique to PC players too. Um, like, but unless you want like the full not like exist. realistic yeah, D&D experience, something like very unique to PC players because save scumming as a concept doesn't even sound scummy to me. So let me tell you right now. First off, auto save doesn't let you pick when you get to save, and on top of auto save, you always had auto save and you had a uh, manual save. And no. save scumming to me just sound like, hey, you reloaded an auto save or you reloaded a manual save. What the fuck is wrong with that? You know how many times yeah. I did that in Final Fantasy VII just because I wanted to get everybody's ultimate limit breaks when I found out I passed it. So I'm an asshole because I went and got my strongest technique. Now fuck you. No, I, I think it's I think it's a really strange thing to be hung up on. But yeah, besides the characters, um, it, it there's a big replay value to this game. I'm on I am on my third playthrough. Um and I still feel like I haven't even like scratched the surface of unlike the possibilities. You know, it and, and, and the games do get easier as you go because you know where everything is. You know how to just race through some of the more irritating places like um the Temple of Shar. I I ran through it in like 10 minutes. Um but that's fine. That's fine because I had more time to explore the Underdark, which is something I didn't do in my first playthrough. 
I, I had more time, like, to really look through Baldur's Gate. I did, um, I did side quests that I skipped my first couple times around because I decided to focus on this character's backstory instead of this character's backstory. Um, it, there's a lot of replay value in that. And I haven't even, I haven't even, like, really touched any of the origin characters, like, um, playthroughs. Because you can play as the origin characters. You can play through the game as Gale. You can play through as Astarian, Lazelle, Karlak, anyone. So you really only use the blank slate, lose the blank slate character when you start as an origin character. Right. And last I checked, you do get some extra story elements if you do that. Mm-hmm. There are NPCs that will, like, show up for your character that, like, you, you know, you will only see very briefly, like, for, um, Gale. His cat shows up. His fucking cat that shows up. That is fucking lame, but continue. <laughs> and you can, um, you can talk to your, you can talk to the cat. It's so cool. No, his cat, his cat is cool as Oh, yeah, fuck. that's right. There's some, there's some character or some class that can talk to animals, right? Oh, yeah, no, it's a spell. Um, talk to animals. Oh, uh, so you can get any, it as long as you're, as long as it animals. gets cast on you, you don't have to actually... You know, yeah. be a magician to get that spell? Yeah. Um, oh, I don't I'm know about that druid. I get. It might be something inherent to, like, druids may have it, like, without needing to cast a spell, but I've never played a druid and I have no intention to. Sorry. Well, damn, are they that bad? People. Well, damn, are they that bad? I just don't bad? care. Uh, no, I just, I have no interest in druid. I really don't. I don't like their spells. I don't like most of their abilities. I just think, I just find them boring, personally. In, like, an actual tabletop D&D game? Cool. Druid sounds cool as fuck. I will do a druid one day in, in like, D&D 5e tabletop. But in this game, um, I mean, maybe. If I get really bored. But yeah, no, that um... Is brutal. Yeah. I just, it just doesn't appeal to me, personally. In my play style. <sighs> Well, I don't yeah. know what the fuck they do, so I'm not going to pretend that I do, but it just sounds like they suck ass. Moving on. Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, what is something you would change about the game? I mean, honestly, I feel... Don't get me wrong, it doesn't have a bad soundtrack. I just feel like if... If they had changed a few things it would have been a little bit more memorable. But as it is, it kind of feels like the soundtrack was kind of an afterthought. It's not bad. I have several songs on my playlist that I will listen to. It just... A, if you asked me, like, oh, what does the battle music for this area sound like? I couldn't fucking tell you. That is a bad sign, but given how strong everything else is in the game, I mean, that sounds like a decent trade-off. Yeah, honestly. Like, it's, it's not bad to be clear it's not bad it's just everything else is so good that the music really did just kind of fall to the wayside i think the voice acting could not have been better though i will say the voice actors went so hard apparently this game turned a lot of them into gamers or it, it at least made them play their the game that they're in because uh, half the women that i'm aware of they keep showing up in my YouTube feed as, like, first time reacting, first time playing Baldur's Gate 3. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, seriously. Um, it's really funny. The voice actors actually played an actual game of D&D &D as their characters, and they live-streamed it. It is one of the funniest things I've seen. <laughs> I have underestimated the amount of people that know how to play D&D. Oh, mean, yeah, I, no, I, I, always, I always thought it was high. But I didn't think it reached the level that it has. Hey, Zax, if I DM'd, would you join a campaign? I'm glad you asked me that. Fuck no. Okay. I don't hate you, but here's how it works. <laughs> Much like Star Wars, when people ask me to do something that I said no to habitually, the new people who don't know no better get fucked by proximity. For instance, you don't know this, but... I actually technically can be considered a weapon master of Tanfa, sword arms, and pole arms. But every time there is lightsabers involved, my friends want me to have a lightsaber fight. Me being me, I turn the lights off. And you know what that means? 
Everyone tells me I'm a fucking cock tease. Grown ass 50 year old woman will tell me I'm being a cock tease by teaching someone how to actually fight with these swords with the lights off. So I just decided, fuck you, I'm never going to go see the Star Wars movies. I'll just continue watching all the shows. And it makes all my friends salty. d and different. I don't actually have a reason to say no other than I don't want to deal with the paperwork while I'm playing a fucking game. So yeah. Fair. I mean, if there Fair. was like, now Ramsey, who I, yeah, you've met Ramsey. Ramsey, when he was teaching me how to do some structural integrity stuff with Exile for the demo, um, he showed me that there's this four hour thing. I don't know what it's called. Uh, there's some version of D&D you can play that's only four hours long. Um, damn it, I wish I remember what it was called. I mean, there's plenty of, like, one-off games you can play. Yeah, that whatever only last a few hours. that shit is. I would do that. But when I told all my friends this, they told me, essentially, stop being a pussy. So I'm just like, okay, fine. I'm not gonna do it unless it's this shit. I mean, honestly, that's kind of what I was suggesting, like a one-off Oh, well, then, yes, thing. I'm totally down. Yeah, also, okay, cool. Also, if you can find that weird shit that was going on in the late 90s, I don't know if you know this, but there were Japanese cartoons being turned into D&D campaigns. Huh. Shit you not. I know it exists. No one believed me for 10 years till they Googled it at random. You would think they would have Googled it when I said it. There is a Tenchi Muyo D&D campaign out there somewhere. Interesting. Somebody homebrewed a... Tenchi Muyo? No, this was an officially released product because I saw it in the comic Wait, book store. Wait, what? Yeah. Hold on, hold on. No, I'm hold serious. On, hold on. No, I don't... What? Uh, okay. It was in a comic book store. It was for sale. It was not some shit that someone just made in their house. Yeah. And I believe there is one for Vampire Hunter D as well. Get the fuck out. You're not joking. Yeah, and here's the weird part. You would think that D&D &D addicts like you would know this before I even came along. The guy who doesn't touch the shit. <laughs> I don't own dice, square or diamond. But somehow, y'all don't know about these rare D&Ds. And I'm just like, how do y'all not know? Now, I don't think this one is actually um, d and I think it's a different um, tabletop system. But yeah, no, there is a tabletop Tenchi Muyo RPG. That's funny as shit. <laughs> I don't know, what the hell is this system? Oh, and uh, there's also, well, there is mm -hmm. an official... It's, I think it's been around for almost 15 Guardians years. Of Somebody made what can only be described as Resident Evil D20. Holy shit. Which is, Uses and the I don't know how long system. it's been around, but somebody made, or for like almost 15 to 10 years, someone figured out how to literally adapt every element of Resident Evil into D&D, &D, and they just keep snowballing it till they got the fifth edition. So somewhere out there, I believe it's called Resident Evil D20. Yep. From like it. 2007 to last month, there is a Resident Evil for every single D&D &D format all the way up to 5E. Is it official? You are not I don't know. Joking. Yeah, I know. But the Tenchi one, if I saw that in a store. Yeah. You know, no, that is that was that was legitimate. That was actually a thing. Let me look up some shit. Wow. Published in 1992. I shit you not. First listing, how to play Lady Dimitrescu in Dungeons and Dragons. Ha. Ah. <laughs> I feel like I don't want to give you that much power. No, you don't. I feel like based on your lack of height, you probably have a pocket fucking Dimitrescu cosplay somewhere in your fucking house. I do, actually. <laughs> I don't know why you laugh. You're not the first midget I met. <laughs> All midgets think alike. Fuck tall people, but at the same time, you want them to bow down to you. You can't fuck have tall ways. people. Fuck tall people, but actually, um, mm, fuck tall people. You know, what do you think? Forget what I was talking <laughs> to. But yeah, that I would do that shit. But I'm telling you right now, <laughs> you better make me a, some type of good guy version of Wesker because I want to fuck up a zombie with super speed. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. I just played. No, oh, no, no. Totally off topic. I played the DLC for Resident Evil 4 Remake. They put Wesker in. We all know what was going to happen when they did that shit, right? Here's what happened. 
shit you not my first night still got the recording on my computer my first night of playing wesker i damn near got s rank on every single stage in mercenaries mode my first try but that's not what was funny i had three minutes of time left over there was one min enemy left i went through the whole map couldn't find this motherfucker right then i heard growling this motherfucker tried to clip into the actual side of the mountain to get away from the ass whooping I was giving. That was beautiful. I, I may never get rid of that entire video recording. Like his body was fused into the side of a pile of dirt so he could get away from the ass beating I was giving. But yeah, if you can do, well, I guess we'll, maybe we're looking at the same thing already, but just in case. If you can figure out how to do this shit. Sorry, I just realized my microphone was off for like a second. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. I, if you, oh, well, I didn't hear anything if you said it. Well, I, I'm just saying, if you can figure out how to do a good guy Wesker build. Yeah, in one of these take a look. Little, little down things, call me to fuck up, figure out how to do it. On, I will buy Discord Nitro if I have to. Okay. Because, because. I mean, I'm not into Resident Evil like that, like that, but if Resident Evil or a short-term version of Star Wars where I better be able to dual wield some shit, you know, if there's something like that, I will do that and call it a day because everyone says, hey, listen, you really should learn this, especially in your game development. This is like rudimentary shit for all structure of hobby gaming. It was like, yes. I'm directly connected to the first family of Dungeons and Dragons. Trust me when I say I know how important Dungeons and Dragons is. My it point is, is, I ain't got time to sit here and play a fucking campaign and shit. Do the short format. Oh, you're a pussy. Okay, well, you know, if you don't no. have anybody who's going to be an asshole to me, I promise you, I will do that Resident Evil shit or I will do some short format Star Wars shit with you. I'm totally fucking down. Okay, sounds good. Um, I'll take a look, see what I can put together. Um, I think it would be really fun to do like a, a little one-off uh, I'm one telling you thing. right now, though, you should probably not be the DM, though. Not because I think you're bad at it. I don't, I'm not going to pretend or disrespect you and say I, I know for a fact you're bad. I don't know shit. But it's going to be annoying to everyone involved if you're teaching me while you're supposed to be the GM. So you might want to not be the GM so you can baby me and shit. <laughs> okay, got it. Okay. Okay, now let's see, where were we? Um Did we do what would you change? No, you already said that. Yeah, it was music. Okay. Yeah. Alright, so well I mean I know how you feel, but if you want to further elaborate, because my answer is fuck you, why do you care they having fun? Right. Uh, exactly. But... That's that's basically mine too. Uh, the only thing is if you're going for that like um like a genuine D D experience, then yeah, no, you're wanna you're just gonna take what you get because there's no take backs in like when you're playing a D&D campaign. You can't just like, oh, I didn't mean to do that actually. Oh, let me take back my role. You can't do that. Um, but if you're playing it just to play a game and have fun, like, who gives a fuck? Do whatever the hell you want. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not your mom. Fuck. Yeah, like... <laughs> I think it's like those people who thought they sounded like the coolest person ever when they used the term hardcore gamer. Like, no. unironically, in public. Like, they, that they thought it meant that that was like a badge of honor. I think those people, those people might be the type of people who, you know, do that stupid shit. No, I think it, I think it just makes you sound goofy and try hard when you're like, I would say <laughs> insecure. Coming. Insecure, that's a good one. Um... Let people play the game however the fuck they want. Bro, bro, like, I mean, we're from a generation where it was assumed you were playing it however the fuck you want to, but I don't know, around the time Call of Duty destroyed the concept of playing games cooperatively online, destroying everything that WoW built up, don't get me wrong, there were assholes on WoW, but you can get rid of an asshole on WoW in like two clicks. And Call yeah. of Duty, not so much. No. Um, especially the frequency of assholes. But... I think I first started noticing that stupidity with Smash Bros. Because when Melee came out, that was the first time Nintendo found a way to make an actual tournament-grade fighting game. And then they pissed off their entire fighting game community. But the thing is, is that everyone was like, how come you're not playing on Final Destination? No items. I'm like, so let me get this straight. 
all the items and things you can do in this game, the dozens and hundreds of combinations you can play this game in, literally, you want to just do the one that doesn't involve using anything that's fun. Man, if you don't get your ass out my fucking face. And also keep this in mind. We weren't grown when Melee came out. So really, it was tweens and teenagers going, Oh, you you a punk if you don't play with Final Destination. I don't play party games like, bitch, you're playing Smash Bros. It's a fighting game. It's ironic how that turned around so quickly because now everyone in their mom and FGC is like, Smash isn't a real fighting game. Like, let me ask you something. If I get into this game and someone, my opponent, gets into this game, what are we supposed to do to each other? Fight. Also, bro, you're playing as Kirby. It's not that deep. Thank you. <laughs> the fuck? And then there's, you know, the whole Diddy Kong thing. If you really want to piss somebody. No, Donkey Kong thing. If you want to piss somebody else. Oh, I'm just going to hold you. And then I'm going to kill myself at the bottom of the stage. I don't care if you think you can survive. I'm still going to make sure you die with me. Like, that shit's hilarious. Um, But I reserve that for assholes. But yeah, I would I would definitely be down if I can be a, a Wesker piece of shit. Uh, don't get me wrong. I understand that I have to have some weaknesses. To my knowledge, his weakness is sunlight or bright lights or normal lights. That's why he's always in sunglasses. But I ain't gonna lie. I would definitely be a good guy version of Wesker. Alias, if you remember her from the... Um, project we finally got her sheet fixed too she had two different faces but apparently no one noticed but me which is weird um she uh is basically a good guy version of wesker for the entire project like mm. her move set is based off of things wesker can do in resident evil 5 and resident evil uh well technically now resident evil 4 remake so i am totally down to learn that shit i will tell you this though uh, I feel like I shouldn't have to buy some dice if you can just, like, mail me, like, three or five. I mean, come on, you got too many. I mean, here's the thing, though. If you use D&D &D Beyond, you click a button, it rolls the dice. Oh. Yeah. Well, shit, you literally thought of everything. <laughs> yeah, it's easy. D&D &D, D &D Beyond does make it, like, really, really easy. I know some people still prefer their, like, pen and paper. Nah, fuck that. Um, nope. Yeah, no. I, I, prefer, I prefer to have it all in one place. And it makes leveling so much easier. Look, I know it sounds... Uh, I'm not saying this as a joke, but I also do mean it. Look, unless you're in prison where you have to do pen and paper, how about we just play D&D &D in a digital format on something? If you got a phone and it can boot up this shit, if you got a computer and it can boot up this shit, if you got a game simulator system and it can boot up this shit, why not just do that? Dude, it was... It, mm, the pandemic fucking opened my eyes because before in D&D, &D, you had your pen, your paper, you had to transport everything, you had your dice, you had all your shit. And you had to be in person. You had to find one day of the week where you could all meet up or your schedules aligned. But during the pandemic, yeah, we now there's like up. websites devoted exactly. to finding remote parties. Exactly, and you can just zoom. You can meet on Discord. I have I have three campaigns that I just we do on Discord, and it's it works so beautifully. We can all just join the same campaign on D and D Beyond, and then wow, look at that. And that's right. Oh. I even have. Bro, I actually have access to people who could even make avatars of fucking characters. So I could literally, in a campaign, give everybody a visual representation of their yep. character. Yeah, no, it's it's easier than ever to play. I'm kinda, and I, I, I love that. that. I am still mad I made your character too fucking OP. I feel bad about it now. <laughs> oh no. I don't even know what he said. You didn't even realize what I did. Nope. <laughs> Zoom in on your character's neck. She's wearing the black and the white material. Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh. So you can literally summon live stream or you could literally break a fucking planet. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's time for my bonus question. Um, All right. Yeah. What was the most ridiculously insane thing that you think you did in game? Oh, fuck. Um, yeah, yeah, that's everyone's reaction. So many choices. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I fucked the mind player. That's and an option? 
That's an option. <laughs> That's an option. You uh, did it on yeah, purpose. I sure did. Are you kidding me? Oh, I saw uh, that oh, monster I and I was just kind of like, absolutely. Oh man, like, no. I know she ain't embarrassed about the shit. Why is she Not even a little bit. It. Oh, that's Not right. even a yeah, you're not tiny alone bit. Right now, that's why you whispered no. it. No, no, you listen here. I like I'm gonna send you a picture. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it wasn't even like See, I wasn't even just a said, If you just said that after I clicked that, you would have got me. You would have got me. But no, I'm not clicking that. But yeah, no. I fucked the Mind Flayer. And you get a trophy for it. Larian knew what the fuck they were doing. You can fuck the Mind Flayer. Just you can curiosity. fuck a demon. You can fuck an Incubus. It's ridiculous. Well, I mean, that kind of makes sense. I mean, it's I mean, yeah. It's... Yeah. Why do I feel like there's somewhere you can fuck a more than one boss in this game you probably shouldn't but i feel you like fuck a bear okay. you could fuck a bear Look, okay everyone knows about that that was literally yeah. the first thing yeah. i ever learned yeah, about yeah, the yeah. game <laughs> i was asking my friends online hey listen you didn't like fuck a bear did you like, no I, I i didn't really play with helson very much he ended up he ended up very thirsty for me anyway that i was romancing gail and gail and gail is very monogamous Oh, um, so you must have hated that. Yeah, I was kind of like, oh, come on, Gail. But okay, I get it. You're like super romantic and cute. I'll, I'll play with it this time. Um, I just like how you, you fucking did not register what I just said. But okay, I like it. Yeah. But he doesn't react if you fuck the mind flare. I noticed. No reaction there. So I did fuck it's the mind, mind flare. It's a mind flare. Yep. Uh, the the trophy, by the way, is called Mind Blown. I'm gonna I'm let that sink in. I feel like there was a time machine, <laughs> and somehow you brain went you went back in time and brainwashed the people who made this game to do that shit. Because that is the most honeybee shit I've ever heard in my life. Right up my fucking alley. The second I realized it was an option, I was all in. I was all in. I was. He's like. He's like being the like mind flares being a little flirty with me, and I'm like, what those tentacles do though? What? I don't. God, I'm literally fucking speechless. Uh, this is. You are literally the only person in the entire world that I can say with an honest face, <laughs> disturbingly as it is. You know, <laughs> I honestly would rather you fuck a bear. Do you know how weird that is? <laughs> yeah. I think I think one of my favorite parts is the uh, the the threesome with the Drow twins, at at the uh, at the brothel what? because okay, there is a brothel. Okay. Who didn't you fuck in this game? Don't actually oh. answer that. Okay. Yeah. No. It's oh it's God. really it's really fun. I um, forget who I'm talking to. God is me. Second, <laughs> you sus. You were born sus. You will die sus. You fucked a mind flare, therefore you are eternally sus. I am sus. You have a sus transmitted disease, as far as I'm concerned. Oh yeah. Incredibly so. At least Laura's honest. I can respect that. Her Instagram <laughs> scares the ever living shit out of me, because ninety percent of the time she's coated in blood. What really blows my fucking mind, and mind you, I've seen her in person. When she said that, oh, I'm not wearing full body makeup, that's just my natural skin. I'm that white. That fucking disturbed me. Because that means that somehow, going from 24 to 27, she got whiter. That shouldn't be <laughs> possible. She lives in California. Not Belgium anymore. I'm not saying she had to have a tan. But that shit was just scary. She went from human being to, I'm the color of a marshmallow. What the fuck? <laughs> Anyways, uh, um, anyways, yeah, uh, I'm down for whatever new content you have in the future. If you want to try to turn that, you know, D and D shit into a video, I'm cool with that. I'm telling you right now, though, um, if you want to do something else with Baldur's Gate three, go get Exile. Okay. Because I think I have too many scars right now. Okay. 
I mean, I'll edit, but... <laughs> oh my... I'm just here to ruin your life. <laughs> you do realize um... how easily you fit into duffel bags, cardboard boxes, and trash cans, right? <laughs> yeah. Trust me, I know. I have fit into many a trash can. Do I even need to say it, or are you going to say it for me? That I'm trash? What kind of trash? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> what kind of trash is there? Many kinds. I'm not making this hard for you. I want you to look at the back of your hand. What kind of trash are you? I'm not white trash. That's a different kind of trash. I am weeb trash, though. See, you just, you have the ball and you get so close to the layup because you can't do a jump shot. And then you just somehow fumble the shit. Oh my God. Perfectly good pun past you and you just fucked it up. Damn. Well, I don't, I don't really know what you're talking about. <laughs> you said it and then you went past it. Okay. <sighs> White trash people. With that being said, that brings this disturbing episode to a close. I've been your host, Zach That Pier Pearson, and please, please try to bleach your brains because I have no idea how to cure whatever virus she just stuck in everybody. <laughs> you should work on your maniacal laughter. Um, <laughs> Enjoy that... your mind flare parasite. Hello, welcome to another exciting episode of Token Podcast. I'm your host and sometimes referee, the friendly neighborhood, Zach Stat Pearson. And today, I'm joined by he who has traveled amongst the stars and has frequent flyer miles, a one Jupiter Exile. Hey, thanks for having me. You can find me on YouTube at youtube.com slash at Jupiter Exile. Always a pleasure to have you. Always enjoy having you on the channel. And here comes a new challenger, uh, one of many on this special edition Baldur's Gate 3 podcast episode. Uh, he who's swagging knows no bounds, but we still have to try a one Bilbo Swaggins. Uh, Mr. Swaggins, you want to tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yes, sir. Thank you for having me first off. But uh, yeah, I'm Bilbo Swaggins. Uh, I'm kind of a good friend of Mr. Uh, Zach's here. It's been a long time since we've had a chat, but... Other than that, I don't, I don't currently have any handles I'm going by right now other than Bilbo Swaggins. Just play a few games here and there. But yep, that'd be all for now. And there's nothing wrong with that. We take all kinds on this channel. Um, Alright, so as if the title didn't already give it away. Uh, instead of having normal topics and talking about funny shit or dumb shit we saw in the media, we're going to be talking about Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, so let's get into it. Um... First, were you familiar with the mechanics of D&D 5e before playing? If not, did you find it easy to learn through gameplay? And for the uninitiated, what this question means is, were you made aware that the entire system of how you get things done is basically based off of Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition? The 5e standing for 5th edition. So if you're wondering why you always have to deal with a virtual dice roll, it's because they wanted to be true to that Dungeons and Dragons soul. All right. Uh, well, uh, Exile, why don't you go first and answer that question? Mm -hmm. So I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition for the entirety of its run. Uh, so that was starting back in 2014. Damn. Uh, I was actually paying attention to a bit of the uh, pre-release materials when they were releasing 5th edition. I was very excited for it because I was one of many. It was kind of... Uh, Underwhelmed by 4th uh, edition, I, I played some 4th edition, but it, it feels very kind of curmudgeon to play at the table if you don't have a lot of tools to help you track uh, a lot of the turn-to-turn -turn variables. So the fact that Baldur's Gate 3 was going to be using Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition mechanics, I was really excited for, uh, it making me really anticipate the release of the game, and especially made me curious about what kind of tweaks they would be making to the baseline 5th edition system. And there are a few, because 5th edition as it exists right now, being, you know, almost 10 years of the game, there are 
well-known uh, deficits and foibles of the system that make a few things exploitable and a few things uh, a little underpowered or weak. Uh, so it's really interesting to see the twists that Baldur's Gate 3 applied to that. Cool, cool. All right, what, <clears throat> all right, what about you, Swaggins? Was this your first time or were you familiar with the system? Cool. All right. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Swaggins, what about you? Was this your first time or are you familiar with the system? Uh, Baldur's Gate was my first time to ever deal with 5th edition at all. Uh, I had started to try to get into D&D &D and never really had a chance to do it because nobody around me is really into it. So, but like, I mean, it was pretty simple to pick up on. Uh, I got an understanding of it extremely quickly. So, I mean, and if I can get an understanding of it quickly, anybody can. So don't sell yourself. You know, battle. I, I found it to be extremely, extremely easy to pick up on. Extremely fun. I've heard from a lot of people that it's quite different from standard fifth edition. But what people have to understand at the same time is it's a game. It has limitations. You know, you can't do everything you can do in a pen and paper role play that you can in a video game. You know what I mean? You, you can do more in pen and paper role play than a video game. So I found it to be uh, extremely easy to pick up on, extremely fun. I mean, I had a blast. And uh, I'm looking to getting into uh, Foundry for D&D &D as well. So that'd be cool. Cool. Um, I definitely want to get around to beating slash playing this game at some point. But, well, uh, I know we ain't talked about what I've been up to, Swaggins. But let's just say between literally making my own game and also being in and out of a recording studio plus an apprenticeship... I do not get a lot of gaming time, but this thing is on my list. It's basically, this is what I'm doing before Final Fantasy VII Remake Part Two comes out at some point. Because the minute Spider-Man 2 is done, I ain't got nothing left. Okay, so that being said, um, moving on to the next question. Story opening thoughts on Mind Flare Parasite as the reason for your adventure. Exile, take us off. So there are a few reasons why this is a really great adventure hook. Uh, one of the one of the things about this, um, in a lot of the published first party adventures, a lot of the pre made materials people of Wizards and uh, other studios put together, you usually see really big like high level monsters as part of the early adventuring to kind of set up the anticipation for something that's going to come. Either there's an encounter with a dragon that you're expected to kind of run away from or not deal with that sets that up for later. So dealing with mind flayers early is a good setup for that, that the, hey, there's going to be mind flayers doing stuff. It's going to be a big part of the game. When I'm sitting down to run a campaign or to put something together, I seldomly think about putting really high challenge monsters in the early parts of the encounter to be that early hook. Uh, so it's very cool. Uh, it's, a, it's a good storytelling punch. But the other thing that's really cool about the Mind Flare Parasite as the, the paradigm for it, it is answering a few different questions and fulfilling a few different needs for the game at the same time. It is identifying why your character is special, why your character needs to act, and it's also providing you with the in for the bad guy team, because they wanted to give you that freedom of choice and the ability to be a, a bad guy, be a good guy, and uh, pick your own alignment as you went through the game. This hook uh, gives you the in to be bad if you want to, uh, and talk right past some of the bad guys. So it, it's really cool that it helps you get through both of those things or fulfill both of those storytelling needs, I should say. Very well thought out answer. Also, side note, I could have sworn, doesn't the concept of a mind flare also exist in Star Wars? Definitely doesn't. Oh. Uh, the mind flare, I'm almost certain, is a copyrighted D&D monster. There could be... there. I think Star Wars has another creature or object that can, like, yeah. steal memories. There's they they, they that's use that in Rogue Mind One. Flare or Flare something. 
I'll, I'll look into it on my uh, at, there, on my earliest convenience. I know there's there might something. be something similar, but nobody else is allowed to use the the combination of words mind flare and have it be the same thing. Gotcha. I would still love to meet whoever the fuck came up with mimic, but I should also not say too much because, well, I'm technically directly connected to the first family of Dungeons and Dragons, despite me never playing it. So. I don't want to accidentally <laughs> insult somebody's mom or dad <laughs> that I would have to explain that shit later. But let's just say I hate mimics. And for those who are curious, no, a mimic is not something that copies what you do. A mimic is a treasure chest that can fucking eat you. I hate those. Well, they have multiple types, too. Why are you trying to give me nightmares? You just got here. <laughs> God damn, I hate mimics. Um... All right, well, uh, you know, as per usual, same question to you, Mr. Swaggins. What do you feel about it? So I wasn't very familiar with anything about Mind Flayers starting uh, Baldur's Gate 3, but, you know, I did my research. I looked it up. As soon as I realized what the story was going to be about, kind of, I started. And uh, I, I did think it was kind of odd. Uh, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me at first, but... The concept of it and like how captivating the story was is what really, you know, like, like, like Exile said, you know, you have that hook to be able to be good or bad and it, it makes it really simple. I mean, it breaks it down to a very, very simple form, allowing you to really think like not only do you get the freedom to think on your own, but then you get that assistance from the Mind Flayer Parasite. So like he said, you get that freedom to talk past enemies. And it really makes, for me, an extremely captivating experience. Like, I mean, you're always super excited. And then, you know, if you if things aren't going the way you want them to go, you always have that little that little bit of help from the Mind Flayer Parasite. And I thought that was just super awesome, man. Like, you couldn't beat it. Because I know Lauren Studios did, like, Divinity Original Sin. And that game was pretty solid, but... Things didn't go your way a lot of the time, and they don't in Baldur's Gate either, but that thing helps you a lot, and I thought it was a super cool way to start a story and to play it in, and it slowly weaves everything together, and it was super nice. I mean, it was just, it was flawless in my opinion. Happy to hear it. All right, uh, Mr. Exile, who's your favorite original character? And for the love of God, try not to swoon longer than five to ten minutes. And what did their individual and what part of their individual stories did you like the best? So my favorite character for Baldur's Gate 3 is Lazel. And there's a couple different reasons. One of them is that Lazel's input to the team personality-wise is in many cases the kind of character that I wind up playing at the table. My favorite thing about playing DD is being ridiculous and hitting stuff. Uh, and Lazel is always the party member who's kind of looking at the dialogue that you're in or the circumstance, kind of grumbling like, why aren't we just punching everybody? Why aren't we just, like, knocking everybody down and then deciding what is right or what should happen? And the greater story around Lazel is so much about her uh, kind of overcoming how she was raised and what she's been told and seeing that character make realizations and pivot on her worldview uh, was a real joy uh, but apart from that I just enjoy how absolutely different she is from everybody and everything she has that alien feel that uh, was fun to explore just uh, interacting with her uh, I felt was, was always a treat Cool, cool. All right, uh, Swaggins, go ahead. All right, this one's to be a little weird, but I always found Gale to be one of my favorite original characters. Uh, his story, like, especially once you you figure out more of his his lore and his story behind him, like, he seems kind of like a like a know it all, and he kind of is. But in the end, like, he's actually a pretty solid guy, in my opinion. Like, it would be somebody I'd want to be friends with in real life for sure. And, like, I don't know, it was just, it was super neat to me that they played him in the way they did. Like, at first, he's super, you know, he's super cocky. You don't really want a whole lot to do with him. And then as you experience who he is, you're kind of like, I understand this dude. I kind of understand why he's the way he is. 
I thought that was super cool. And like, I mean, there's a couple of the characters I, I'm a super big fan of. Like, I love Carlac for the obvious reasons. And then uh, I liked Asterion just because I thought he was funny. I really love the dialogue in game with him. But yeah, I think Gale would have to be my favorite of all the origin, origin characters. So I'm going to keep that one short and sweet because. Well, nothing wrong with that. I mean, this is legitimately going to be a ridiculously long video. It's just going to feel short to you two because you're going first. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, what was your uh, alpha team? What was your A team for most of the game's trials and tribulations and why? I would say that I didn't have necessarily a go-to team, but there are a few standout builds and options that uh, really leapt to the fore. You can customize every single character, so you don't need to take the origin characters as they are and just slot them into a team. But there were a few cases where I did. Um, I, I made a lot of use out of Beastmaster Ranger and Tempest Cleric. The Beastmaster Ranger has a huge, brutally powerful toolkit. When you first get access to an animal companion, it may not be that impressive, but each of your animal companion options gets new abilities at 5th, uh, I think, 8th and 11th level, and by the end you're sitting on this enormous toolkit of abilities, you're throwing down a huge amount of hit points onto the battlefield, it's really good. And that's apart from whatever the heck you're doing with the actual ranger. Uh, and as for the Tempest Cleric, um, Call Lightning that you can maximize through your channel divinity is a hell of a drug. You just look at a group of enemies, you throw a jug of water at them, and then you just snap call down like 80 lightning damage in, a, in an AoE. And then you just proceed every turn to keep calling down yet more lightning damage. You get uh, utility in the form of knockbacks, solid spells like shatter. It's just immensely, consistently useful. Cool. Um, well, purpose. Uh, I, I I know it sounds weird, but I feel like it's a blessing and a curse when you make a game and people have a set team that they almost never deviate from. Because at what point is it? Oh, they like the characters and how they feel and it's cool. Versus these assholes just want to play the meta game and they're meta hounds, you know. But I like that answer. All right, Swaggins, go ahead. All right, so my meta team was my my custom character with Carlac respect to a fighter, which my custom character was a fighter. Then I took Gale respect into a, into a sorcerer, uh, a storm sorcerer, and then respect Shadowheart into a life domain cleric. And uh, I carried around a bunch of. Uh, the barrels, the explosive barrels, I can't remember what they're called, smoke powder barrels, and threw those like grenades to start my fights. So, and like, and I respect throughout the game, depending on the fights. Like, if I needed more healing, I would multi class my fighters into clerics as well. It just really de was really dependent upon the fight, in my opinion. So sometimes I would swap out and take a Starion. Sometimes I would swap out and take Lazelle if I needed a, a different fight, like fighting style. So, to me, it was really dependent. I, I adapted a lot to each individual battle according to what I needed for each character. Which, yeah. I love that about a game. I mean, that's that's awesome, you know. Like you said, I, I don't like the meta chasers as well. I'm not a huge fan of that. But being able to actually adapt your team constantly and for every individual battle is super, super cool. Yeah, I think, I think that's a cool way to play. I mean, I might, I might honestly end up doing something like that. Here's something I'm curious about. You know, this is one is for both of you. So the predetermined characters, right? Can you change their class, or is their shit set and it can only level up in the tier that they start in? You can change them around. Yeah. The only thing you can't change about them is their race and their background, which is you know the racial abilities 
and one of their skills is going to be uh, no, two of their skills will be locked based on the background. Yeah. I mean, but that's you can still do a lot with just oh, being yeah. able to respect their classes. Okay, because that actually clears up a lot for me. I don't think I'm gonna end up making a what you call it, making a custom character then because. Now, I'd rather go down the character's trees, story trees, instead of having a custom character at that point. Especially if I know I can make them be whatever class I want them to be. So, okay, so I have a secondary playthrough. Oh, go ahead. That's kind of, kind of what I did. My, my custom character, I just made the healer. And then I was basically playing off of uh, Asterion as my main character which is super fun. Yeah, my first time through, I was playing Astarian rather than doing uh, a custom anything. And when I'm doing solo, I think I like that more. If I'm playing with a group, I prefer to just play a custom character because I don't want to spend more time on the individual stories unless there's like a good content unlock or a very important reason to be the character. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Now, I'm also curious. So... Obviously, if you have, it's like any video game, if you have a strong affinity or bond with the character, you get to go down more of their story paths. But can you do that for everybody in the game, or is it just certain characters that you can go down a bond path and get more extra story elements with if you don't have a created character? Well, it's got to be somebody who's recruitable to the party. So there's, you know, a certain range of characters that actually have stories that you can recruit. There are some optional recruitables as well, if you're uh, paying attention. Yeah. Ooh, secret characters. Yeah. I miss those. Mm -hmm. See, I think I think I was able to get very... In my first playthrough, I was able to get pretty deep in three characters' lore. Like, pretty pretty deep into there. And it was, it was really good. Like, it played together very well. It played out very smoothly. Without being all weird, kind of like uh, the old Dragon Age games. Ha <laughs> ha! That was one of the first things I started mentally comparing Baldur's Gate to. I don't hate Dragon Age by no stretch of the imagination, but I look at Baldur's Gate and I was like, is this basically Dragon Age if it was top down? And then, and then everyone was like, no, uh, Bal uh, Dragon Age is basically Baldur's Gate if it was action adventure. I was like, okay, I get it. It's got that pimp status. Well, I mean, I, I love Dragon Age as well, but... If, if you ever played Dragon Age and you ever did any of the romance or trying to delve into people's lore, the people around you, it was all weird and nothing really felt right. And Baldur's Gate fixed that issue, in my opinion. Yeah, I felt like very just a couple characters in, in Dragon Age were written in a way that I would say is, is complete. Uh, but apart from that, the things that is going on with the romances of those characters feels more divorced from the story. In Baldur's Gate 3, your companion characters are very well threaded into the main char uh, into the main storyline. Nice. Okay. All right, moving on. Um, well, I mean, it was going to happen eventually. Good old-fashioned romance. Who is your favorite to romance and how do you think Larian handled relationships in game? Also, before anyone says anything, I'm going to point out, yes, I am aware, acutely aware, that they accidentally made a glitch that made it easy for everybody to thirst after your character. That's funny. But just keep that in mind. I, I, have, I have been made aware of it. All right, go ahead, Exile. So I won't go into the glitch details. Uh, the, the romance paths that I have seen are the Shadowheart romance, the um, Lazelle romance, and... Uh, the, the beginning of the Minthara romance path, which is on the evil playthrough. I haven't gone very far on that. Um, out of those, uh, I, I enjoy the Lazelle romance the most because it's quirky and her romance lines are really strange. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there's, there's one part of that romance path that uh, she duels you, uh, which is pretty great. It's like, you must be able to best me in combat. Um, but it was, it was, it was interesting. Uh, so the thing about this take that, uh, the Larian's take on romance that was refreshing and different is that these characters are more casually affectionate in a lot of cases or more casually intimate. Some of the characters are still more kind of, uh, buttoned up both figuratively and literally. Uh, but I think that 
these more, uh, the, they're, the ability to have casual flings feels a bit more true to life than the idea that you need to be invested in a character for like 20 hours of something AKA in order monogamous. to, yeah, in order to get to a romantic scene with uh, one character or another. Uh, and this had to be kind of uh, pointed out. Uh, I was watching a video by somebody else. They were commenting like, hey, you know, this is a, this is a bunch of um, really attractive people staring death in the face. It probably makes a lot of sense for them to be available and intimate uh, without a whole lot of hassle. <laughs> okay, that that's kind of funny. All right, uh, Swaggins, what about you? So I've done the Shadow Heart, uh, Carlac. And there's another character I can't remember their name right now. I'm drawing blanks. Oh. And Gail, I don't know why I forgot, but, and, uh, you know, some of them were, as, as Exhaust said, they were, they were buttoned up and it was still good. I mean, it was even just the story, the way it plays out and the amount that you learn, like how much lore it opens up for certain characters, in my opinion, was great. Like it, it felt really good. Uh, some of them were kind of annoying, like the, the struggle of balancing everything that you had to do. Cause I didn't do any kind of glitch or anything. I just played the game and uh, it was good. It was very good. In some cases, uh, one of the romance options at the end of the game made me cry grown man crying over a video game, but that's just a staple of how good the game plays out. In my opinion, I mean, it, you get so yeah. attached to everything you get so drawn into the story. I mean, I, I, I don't really have a whole lot to say on the romance options cause I haven't explored them all yet. The three that I have, they were extremely well written, and it makes sense, kind of like Exile said. Everything, uh, yeah, I wouldn't blame any of the people for having flings. You know, you're kind of in a bad situation, so makes it, yeah, you know, it was good. I mean, damn, this game gotta be. I mean, damn, this game gotta be good if fucking made fucking almighty swaggins get a tear. Don't get me wrong, you know, it's rare. Hey, it wasn't just a tear. I was ugly crying, brother. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> I'm trying to picture that now. I mean, like, look, when Final Fantasy VII Remake first came out, that first day when you get past the first mission, you come out of Tifa's fucking bar, like, for like two hours. I wasn't ugly crying, but my face was a faucet. I'm not going to lie. Because you got to think, man, I wanted that. Everyone wanted that for over 10 years that little yeah i'm gonna say it cock tease they did when the ps3 first got announced people were so pissed when they found out it meant nothing essentially i get it i really do get it but for this game to be picking up people for the first time because almost most of the players of this game never touched two never touched one um most of, or wasn't even born when one came out um you know for it to do that to people like that's a good product and I'm sure, you know, you can insert that hokiness of, look, you know, you want more stable individuals. You don't want people shooting up schools. You know, we need to have more people, men, women, and children comfortable with expressing basic emotions. I get it. I'm I'm not going to give you shit about it. But that lets me know this game is ridiculously good if it did that to you. I so, say, you know me, I'm pretty stoic. So, yeah, for it to, like, to me, I was, I, was, I was extremely impressed. I mean, game of the year. So if something else wins Game of the Year, I'll be amazed. That would not make sense at this point. First off, I, I, I agree with y'all, despite me not even playing the game, but here's here's what I raise you. Did y'all forget that a lot of people like to quote the, uh, the Video Game Awards like it's the fucking gospel? Or official, in any capacity? I don't know why the fuck they do that. It, it disturbs me. That'd be like, if I'm, if I'm in a car, and someone took the engine out, but a toddler says there's an engine in the car... See, I told you there's an engine in the car. No, bitch, my, my engine's still fucking gone. I don't know why people just decided that somehow an award show that is partially owned by snack food companies somehow speaks for the entire fucking country or the planet. Don't understand that logic. But honestly, I would feel disrespected and I'd even play the game. Because, you know, 
next year, I can tell you right now, Game of the Year is coming out February 24th, and it's Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Yes, I brought it up a third time. Fuck you. But I promise you, there will always be a contrarian who wants to be an asshole. Best you can do is ignore them. Um, all right, so moving on. How do y'all feel about the story? Was it compelling? Did you play your first time through? And also, why the fuck does she have three questions in one topic? God damn woman. Okay, we're going we gonna to divide this up real quick. Since we're already on it, how did you guys feel about the story? Like, how did it make you feel? What were some high points for you? So, story is excellent. Uh, I still haven't finished Act 3. Uh, I haven't finished the whole game, but I've been immensely enjoying uh, almost everything I've played through. The uh, There's a dozen twists, and you have the ability to make a lot of compelling choices. And I got to the later part of the game, and I really found myself puzzling and wondering uh, how things could have been different or how things could have intertwined differently. You have a lot of your early choices uh, either coming back to congratulate you or coming back to bite you, uh, depending on how you handle things in the earlier part of the game. And that's really interesting to see how everything kind of plays out and comes together. And you've got multiple axes of choice, because you're not just deciding whether you're going to be good or evil throughout the game. Uh, there are more subtle aspects of your conduct, and a lot of that does... Uh, does play through in terms of how you're handling your companions. There are, there are parts of the game where if you make certain choices or you don't bring a companion along during something that they would say is important to them, you're going to lose them, uh, on top of the missable characters as well. So just looking through those complexities and the fact that the game is more than willing to let you miss content uh, was... Uh, very interesting in, in terms of getting a first playthrough. And for the first playthrough, I was mostly just trying to be like, let's just go through the game. If I miss things, I miss things. Uh, I will enjoy what I find. But I was just so intrigued about what else could have happened. <laughs> and I had to boot it up again, start another party, and I still haven't finished. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Swaggins, how you feeling? Oh yeah, I, uh, there's so many things that I the, this this one's a hard question, man. The, the story overall is is fantastic. I mean, I I I've played a couple story. I played a lot of story games, but I played a couple that I could kind of compare it to, but in the grand scheme, they don't compare at all. So, like like I said, I mean this this game made me ugly cry more than once. This game. It's phenomenal, in my opinion. The story was written extremely well, and like Exile said, when Karma comes back to bite you, she bites hard. She bites real hard, and it like there's things that I I did in my first playthrough that I was devastated towards the end, especially towards like the end of Act Three. I was like, dude, I like I wish I could go back now, you know. And I, I tried not to save scum my first playthrough, so like. Some of the choices I made, like I made them just out of brash thinking or, you know, trying to get through some dialogue because I was wanting to do something. And man, it, it really makes you pay for things. And then the other things, when they come back, they are extremely helpful. Like some of the choices you get to make, are, are especially in Act 1, that you wouldn't think would play in so late into the game. are It's pretty wild. Cool. All right, now let's further divide this one fucking question that is somehow fucking for. I'm going to have to talk to her about this when we get to her. Um, all right. What was your favorite class to pick, Exile? So my uh, class race combination, the first time through, I played Astarian as a rogue, which is, you know, uh, Elven Rogue. The reason I went with the rogue is I wanted to have, ac I wanted to have expertise for my first run through the game, which makes you much better at a few select skill checks. Uh, I knew going in, or I had an expectation going in, that there would be some content locked behind certain skill checks. In some cases, literally behind locked doors, or in other cases, I wanted to be able to finesse my way through certain conversations to <laughs> get into the, the more intriguing ways of how things could play out, whether through perception or deception. 
and Rogue is a go-to class to be able to pull off all that nonsense and get behind all the necessary doors, behind all the guards, and see like the nitty-gritty underneath uh, all of the situations you're going to have to deal with. Cool. Um, all right. Um, now, did you not care about the race, or was there some specific races that you chose for a specific reasoning? The the race doesn't. Oh wait, impact... sorry, sorry, I forgot to ask Swaggins. Yeah, go ahead about the classes, Swaggin. I played a fighter. I played a dual weapons fighter, and that's pretty much what I've stuck to the entire time. Uh, the reason behind it is because. I know that there's a certain item in Act 2 that I can get. And I can play, I can completely redo my character after Act 2 once I get that item. You can say uh, spoiler shit here, bro. Go ahead and call it out. There's some gloves of dexterity that give you 18 dexterity just from equipping them. So once I get those, I respect my character and dump my dexterity and then re put all my stats in other places that are needed. Uh, and after, after, after I found that out, I, I cannot stop playing fighter. I love the fighter class. Uh, it's an v- extremely versatile class, just depending on how you play it. I mean, I can use a bow, you know, because you get your uh, your feats or whatever, and you get your different, like, you can pick your weapon proficiencies. I always go dual weapons and archer. So I have the archer ability. You know, I'm extremely proficient with that, which you use a bow a lot more as a fighter than you would think you would. And then, obviously, you have your special abilities as a fighter, like your pushing strikes, your menacing strike, uh, cleave. Or it's not called cleave; it's called some sweeping strikes. Those are just extremely phenomenal abilities. You have a lot of HP, and in my opinion, I want my character to be strong. But I, I try to find a good balance between gear between all of my companions. So, me having those gloves will make up for the downfall of spreading my gear out. So, in my opinion, it, the fighter's just the way to go. I'm biased, though. I haven't really... I played a couple other characters, but I like the fighter a lot. Not gonna lie, I'm one of those guys that likes looking up broken builds before I even think about touching the game. Is it is it wrong? Maybe, but let's think about it in the long scheme of things. All games get patches. All games get balanced. What's ridiculously OP today is meh tomorrow. That's how I look at it. So I was trying to see, you know what? Can you make a mage dual wield magic weapons somehow? That's what oh, I yeah. was looking into. I'm I'm currently one of one of my playthroughs that I'm playing with a buddy. I'm playing a sorcerer with the dual wielder feats so that I can dual wield magic staffs and stack their benefits. It is sometimes really crazy because I know where to find the really good staffs. You know, when you get a chance, uh, Swaggins that dexterity item let me know where it is in game at some point in time you put in my dms i am going to find that thing and i'm going to experiment with the concept of how easy or hard is it going to be for me to make a fucking ang from avatar in this bitch because if i can make someone using elemental magic who can dual wield and punch and kick you i'm changing that little bastard's name to ang i'm not joking yeah you can just play a four elements monk and get that that item's on a vendor yep so you just buy it but then on top of that as well you know de- dexterity plays a lot into your uh, initiative role and dude having a, a solid character and that's the reason why i did it I, you know you always build your custom character to be your like your strongest because that you just yeah, it's you like just the more. habit yeah. everyone does yeah having your one of your strongest characters be the first in a fight every time to attack is phenomenal. Sounds like it, brother. Okay. Um, now let's see. Can I divide this anymore? Nope. That's it. All right. So you want to ask about races? Oh yeah. Forget. Um, all right. So, uh, the races that you guys played in game, was there any particular reason that you picked them or was it just the aesthetics? So there are, uh, there are a few good reasons to play a few different races, and I've tried a few different things. Um, the unique dialogue options for some of the races are excellent. Um, there are a lot of unique dialogues. If you are playing the Drow, the Githyanki, 
Um, mechanically and in terms of the rules of the game, I can almost never get myself away from playing dwarves and half-orcs because they have abilities that let them live better. Uh, dwarves get more HP, half-orcs uh, have an ability that once per day, when they would die, they're instead left with one health. And this is a carryover for me from tabletop because I get hit real hard. The <laughs> I, I, I get dropped. I am on the floor, pancake mode, all the time. <laughs> uh, maybe I, I don't At know least what's he's good honest. for me. Maybe I don't know what's good for me. Maybe the DM's dice are out to get me one way or another. I need that extra edge to stay alive. But um, Baldur's Gate 3 also allows you to play the Deep Gnomes, uh, which are not necessarily playable, and their racial abilities are patently unfair. Uh, they are a super powerful race to play. Uh, is not only do they get the gnomes' magic resistance, they also get a very long-range dark vision, so you won't be at a disadvantage in caves or dark areas. And they also get advantage on stealth, which is really useful. I know it sounds weird, but I'm definitely going to, like, jack one of your builds, Exile, just because it's not that you play games similar to me. Technically, I don't know if you do or don't, but the builds I would try to experiment with, you've already done. I know a lot about Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. When you sit down to play, just, you know, give me a tag. I'll, I'll uh, help you out with building whatever you want to do. You tell me, like, the fantasy, and I'll tell you the way to achieve it. To be fair, I know for a fact that, you know, Swaggins would love a D&D &D community, but at a bare minimum, you know, uh, I don't know if you still in or you got out yet, but even if you haven't, um, there are thriving online D&D &D communities. Like, if you get into one of those, bro, I'm pretty sure you're going to find a whole new wealth of people and shit to, like, play games with, because... Let me tell you, Exile so deep into the medieval era, this man has his own LARP group. Sounds like fun. Oh yeah, seven years of hitting each other with foam swords. It's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I know like the 90s basically tried to make LARPing look like this is how you maintain your virginity, kids. But the shit's basically a Ren fair where you can actually hit people. If you really saw him think about it, Yeah, if, pretty much. Like, if you really saw him think about it, why is it that people don't catch shit for going to a Ren fair, but if you go to a LARP, you're, you're somehow, like, a societal disease? Nah, nah, that don't, that don't sound right to me. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a LARPer, but I don't hate people who LARP. You go to a stage in Broadway to see a show, you expect people to live-action role-play. So, these guys decided to do it in the forest? What the fuck is the problem? They ain't hurting nobody. And also, it's like cross-country improv. Exactly. I mean, I do mill sims for their soft, so I mean, that's just LARPing. It's I don't care what anybody like says. That. It's it's just a different genre. They just of too the scared same to admit idea. it. <laughs> they are just too scared to admit it. That is a hundred percent it, because dude, hundreds of people don't come around and dress up like soldiers to fight each other, and it be considered not LARPing. I mean, if you do it in the medieval era, you're still LARPing. If you do it in the modern era, you're still LARPing. Reenactments, LARPing. technically LARPing. Oh, and they just like getting so offended about splitting hairs. They're like, hey, hey, listen, I'm not the one who's insecure about what I'm doing. <laughs> Let me put it to you that way. Um. All right. So uh, did you have any preferred racist swaggings or did we go over that with you? I played anything with a lot of dark vision because I wanted to make sure that I had a, I wouldn't have a disadvantage in dark places to hit because I got real tired on my first playthrough as a human of uh, having to put candles and then light them in the battle arena. That sounds like a legitimate pain in the ass. So then I got... I don't even think I got all the way through Act 1 on my first playthrough, then I re-rolled an elf. And God then, damn. I think I was a half-elf, and then yep. that's the playthrough I ended up finishing the game with. It can be a pain in the neck if you don't know the, uh, the trick for it. The simplest trick, of course, is any class that makes more than one attack, make your first attack throwing an alchemist's fire at them. <laughs> Then your enemies will be on fire, and thus easy to see. 
Oh my god, I never get tired of his strategies. Well, I have a I have a question for Exile though. Yeah. Did you hold on to all of your like grenades and stuff or were you using them every chance you had? Oh man, we have so many piles of grenades and I've played characters and setups that are throwing one or two grenades a turn depending on what's going on. Uh, some of the grenade types in the game are just so cheap. You can buy them in bulk. Um, you can very easily steal them because the difficulty to steal something from a vendor is based on how expensive it is. So like Alchemist Fire and Water Jugs are super cheap. The Water Jug is one of the best grenades in the game because uh, when you have the, the wet status effect on an enemy, they take double damage from lightning and cold. So you just have one... I, I run around with somebody in the party is carrying 20 water jugs, and their entire job in a combat is to just throw water jugs at everything, and the next guy follows it up with uh, Call Lightning or Cone of Cold, just does immense damage. <laughs> and now you see why I will never fight against Exile in a strategy game. Hey, that's what I did. I've... In Act 2, you get that chest of the mundane and fill it full of smoke powder barrels. And that's how I started every single fight. I'm you sorry. Pull it out. Chest of mundane. So, so everything you put inside the chest of the mundane is turned into like a spoon or something innocuous. And it reduces the weight. So you can carry these 50 pound smoke powder barrels, like a hundred of them at a time in this chest. I'm just blown away that it's called the chest of the mundane. Don't get me wrong. That sounds accurate, but that is hilarious. It's the only object in the game that acts like a bag of holding. Yeah. So like I said, I like I use everyone else use smoke powder grenades. I use smoke powder barrels as my grenades. That sounds ridiculously busted as shit. <laughs> it was so fun. <laughs> Oh my god, I, I can't wait. Like, I know I'm gonna edit your footage, Exile, but I can't wait to, like, just watch it normally. Obviously, I don't I'll, have six hours to myself, but... I'll make sure that I bake in some big smoke powder barrel explosions so you can enjoy that. Yes, because I promise you, there will be memes added in this video at some point. I'm honestly considering just saying fuck it, paying somebody 60 bucks once I get it down to, like, an hour or two. Or paying them like a hundred bucks. Hey, look, here's six hours. Here's the game. Go have fun. Come back to me when you're done. <laughs> okay, moving on. Because I'm sure we could be on crazy antics all day. Um, yeah. What was your favorite part of the game? And what was your most hated part? And how would you change that hated part? I've got two answers to this, I think. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, so, m overall impression is very good, of course. Um, the thing that I like best about the game, I would say, is all of the magic items. There are tons of different magic items. There are magic items that are catered to almost every type of thing you can be trying to do. They are hidden in all sorts of places. There's like a dozen very useful magic rings that are hidden on unmarked skeletons. Sometimes they're like halfway up a ledge, uh, but it allows you to make a big variety of character builds. And I think one of the problems with Dungeons & Dragons, the tabletop as it exists right now, is there's not enough variety of magic items to make you feel good about every kind of character you can play. If you look in the Dungeon Master's Guide, which is where the baseline magic items are. There's a bunch of maces, there's a bunch of swords, there's a few different magic staffs, but there's only about one bow in that entire book. And if you want to play an archer, you, your dungeon master needs to be creating stuff for you pretty actively for you to feel like the game is actually in your corner. So that was really great. The other thing I uh, specifically really enjoyed is towards the end of Act 2, you have a major choice to make, uh, and that is tied into Shadowheart's storyline uh, specifically. And that moment where she's choosing to uh, follow through on her worship of an evil god, 
or try and turn her life around um, was a really excellent moment. Um, and hearing the stories from friends as well in terms of how they handled that interaction uh, was really cool. So both the fact that there's a big pivotal moment for that character that might be able to transform how you think about the character and also hearing from other people uh, how they handled that moment was really excellent. Cool. All right, what about you, Swaggins? What did you love and what did you hate and how would you change the shit that you hate? So I'm going to go ahead and throw this out here. Uh, the second thing that x was talking about was going to be my first thing I was going to say. Uh, and the way I played it was extremely interesting. I really didn't put my two cents in on it and just let her do what she wanted to do. Uh, but then the, one of the other things I really, really enjoyed was... Uh, uh, it, a lot of games you play you just feel like you're kind of reading a book or gliding through a story. You know what I mean? Baldur's Gate 3, in my opinion, pulled you in, and I didn't feel like... I, I felt like I was part of it. I didn't feel like I was just an onlooker just trying to get through a game or reading a book. I felt like I was one of the characters there. And like, and like I said, in my opinion, not a lot of games make you feel that way. So just the fact that... like. Whenever you're making the choices, it's not about... It's kind of like D&D. &D, like everyone tells me, because I've never played, but... it's Your character is a part of you eventually. If you play the character long enough, it becomes a part of you. And Baldur's Gate really drew that in for me, and I really felt like my character was me. You know? like, and I, I don't know, maybe that's just a personal thing, but like I said, that... The feeling like I was there and making choices instead of just making choices on a screen was phenomenal. And more games need to do that. Damn, man, I'm... I Well, don't get me wrong. I, I always thought you were silent, the silent guy, but I love how descriptive you are, bro. I love how descriptive you are. That is some deep shit. Um, well, I mean, I got exile here blowing me out of the water, so I'm trying to keep up. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, he, here's the weird thing, you know, uh, despite him having that Doctor Strange, you know, getting all the younger girls appeal, he's actually younger than me, which kind of blows my mind. Yep. I'm just uh, 33 last month. Congrats. Okay. Okay. So um, let's see what else you got down here. All right, so we all know it, we all love it, or we all just admit that it's the dirty secret, like your entire porn search history. Personally, I don't hold it against nobody, like your porn search history, barring few exceptions. Um, save scumming. Did you do it, or were you a purist, and why? I think there are a few cases where it's okay to do some save scumming. Such as... I I'm, gonna, I'm getting to it. I'm getting to it. <laughs> I don't like save scumming to try and get through like a skill check roll in a dialogue or something like that. So if you're, say, you have a 50 50 shot in order to uh, like lie to somebody in an important way, uh, I, I don't think it's okay to reload there. You just tell the lie and you either get away with it or you don't, and you gotta live with the consequences where I think it's okay to save scum a little bit. I don't like reloading more than, say, twice to try to get a certain outcome. But if you are trying to steal an object that you have, like, a 5% failure chance to successfully steal the thing, and you get caught, and it sets a whole bunch of NPCs to aggressive mode because it's one of the groups of guys that doesn't have a prison cell, they just decide, oh, you're caught thieving, we're just going to kill you. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe reload the game because it's just really crazy and annoying to try and get that reverted back to uh, a, a peaceable state. Um, uh, let's see, the other case where I think it's okay to reload is if if you've got half the party already dead in the combat, is just reload that sucker. And sometimes there are dialogue options 
that don't look like they're going to do what they're going to do. Like the dialogue option seems like it's going to go one way and you make a choice and the dialogue continues a little bit and like four characters die in that dialogue. It's like, oh, okay, I didn't want to make that choice. I'm going to, I'm going to back that up a bit. It's not that you're reloading because you like failed a roll of the die. You're reloading because a dialogue seemed like your character was just going to sit back and say, hmm, hmm, let me consider this. And what it actually meant was your character was going to stand back and watch while some heinous shit went down. <laughs> okay. But apart from that, you got to live with the consequences. Like, if you if you decide that you're going to risk it for the biscuit in the middle of a, of a dialogue tree, and that goes wrong, you got to live with it. The game already has a system to let you get through that stuff. If you're exploring the world, you're going to earn inspiration. You can spend inspiration to re-roll the dice to avoid bad outcomes. That is the system you have. Y you don't need to save scum on top of that system. Very interested in how you would play XCOM 2. But, um, Poorly. <laughs> I, I, at least he's honest. At least he's honest. Um, okay, now, I know I didn't explain it for the layman's out there, but I'm going to go ahead and do it before I get into you, Swaggins. Um, so, save scumming is a tactic used to basically undo unfavorable outcomes. Very, very common in a lot of strategy games where everything you do has an element of chance attached to it. So, essentially... Um, it's almost like Prince of Persia for the for those who played it. You screw up, you accidentally kill yourself, you can literally rewind time to where you didn't die. However, instead of only having three times you can do it, it's kind of sort of infinite. Some game companies even just accept it as an inevitability, and others just don't even want to give you the option to have really more than one or two slave slots. Maybe not necessarily because of saves coming, but because they don't think you need more than one or two save slots. Um, all right. Brief explainer. Sorry I took so long. All right, Swaggins, uh, go ahead and um, let us know how you feel about saves coming. So, in your in your first playthrough, in my opinion, don't save scum. You're, you're ruining the game. You're ruining the game. That's the whole point is to see. is Your actions are what caused this. Don't ruin the game. Don't ruin it for yourself. You're, you're going to miss out on so much. It gets so interesting. Now, did I save scum? On two things, yes. I saved scum for achievements, and then I reloaded my save and went back through with the exact same option I picked. And uh, I had my party die, and I went to Withers, and I accidentally donated the souls of my party to him. So I, what? Why is yeah. that even an option? I don't know. I Does it know do anything? Do yes, yes. You can't get your companions back. So it doesn't do anything. It just makes the game harder. Yes, and I was like looking, and I was like, what just happened? And so I was looking into it, and I was like, I can't revive them now. It didn't even give me the option. So I was oh. like, okay, I'm going to reload my save. Man, I better be I better be able to turn autosave off. That sounds scary as fuck. So, I mean, because whenever I would lose the fight, if I could at least get one person out of there, depending on the fights, I know some of them you can't. Uh, you do have to reload your saves there. Uh, um. If I could escape, I would just go ahead and pay Withers to revive my party. But that was the first time I had ever done it. And I accidentally, do like, my main character made it out and the other three died. And I donated all of their souls at one time without reading dialogue properly. You've learned and a that was lesson. A, yes, that was a safe scum. 100%. <laughs> I wouldn't even call that scummy. <laughs> like... I don't know what the positive version of that phrase is, but I wouldn't call that summy, scummy. But yeah, and other than that, I think I did it for achievements. But like I said, I would go go ahead and basically I would go through with my playthrough, load back before the dialogue, and then do other dialogue options if I knew there was an achievement there. If I knew there wasn't, I wouldn't worry about it. It's just a waste of time. Okay. Well, with that being said, I finally get to ask my little bonus question. What was the most insane shit you did or caused in-game? Exile, I don't have popcorn and I wish I did, but I'm going to enjoy your answer. I'm only going to give you two. So, um, 
one <laughs> bit <laughs> How in you feel the cheap. early game in a certain underground cave there is a very large spider this thing is like um it's like an elder phase spider thing in the jig it's got like 150 health or something crazy so it's kind of like an early mini boss thing it's it's optional you don't have to go for it um but i was fighting that in a group with some friends i was playing as a warlock and uh the warlock's eldritch blast ability you can get what's called an invocation that adds a 10 foot knockback to this Eldritch Blast. So this spider boss is hanging out on some like web walkway stuff. It's kind of suspended. There's like a chasm beneath it and this whole thing is this underground cave with these chasms around. So I fired a couple blasts at the giant spider uh, and it went flying back off into the darkness and was instantly dead. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it's just like, like the Eldritch Blast that normally does like uh, 10 or 20 damage between multiple blasts. Just spider gone. Absolutely gone. Uh, so that one's pretty funny. But I think that's happened to a lot of people. There's actually an achievement for dunking that spider in the pits. <laughs> um, Was it the, called Get Dunked On? I don't remember what it's called. Damn. But I'd have to check it out. Um, the other thing was pretty ridiculous that more happened to me. Um... In the Grim Forge area of the Underdark, there is a character uh, from whom you can acquire a Rune Powder Vial. This is like a next level smoke powder barrel uh, that you can acquire. I, I actually don't remember how it stacks up with the smoke powder barrel, but you can get it as part of a little storyline quest, and you can use it to clear away some rubble in an area and continue the plot. But the rubble in that area can also be blasted by other smoke powder barrels or normal smoke powder bombs. You don't have to use the rune powder vial. So in a playthrough, uh, a buddy of mine and I decided, you know, the rune powder vial probably be pretty useful later down the line. So let's just clear out this rubble without using the rune powder vial, and we can keep the rune powder vial in our back pocket. So my designated grenade thrower in that run was Lazel, and so I had the rune powder vial as well as a whole bunch of other grenades and throwables in her inventory. And I was playing a custom Githyanki character uh, going through the Lazel romance while my buddy was uh, playing some other character I forget and I think he was doing the Karlak romance in that run. Uh, so one night uh, Lazel's like, I just gotta duel you. We have to fight to prove like dominance because Culturally, I'm just super into this. This is like romantically, this is what I need. So oh, we no. start fighting, and um, maybe a couple rounds into the combat, she throws the rune powder vial at me and detonates it. <laughs> she throws the rune powder vial and follows it up with alchemist fire to set it off in my face. <laughs> That's like a little mini nuke in the campsite <laughs> with how much damage this thing does. It took out both of us. Are we... you sure that's your friend? Because <laughs> I had her, I had her fairly, uh, fairly low at the time, uh, so we both blew up. It triggered the next part of the dialogue, and she like wa she walks away like satisfied from the duel, and I'm still uh, <laughs> in the bleeding out state on the floor <laughs> because it it didn't check for us both being in the mutual KO. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, I'm I'm in Discord with my buddy, uh, getting through the end of the scene. Like, Lazel, Lazel, come back! I'm bleeding. <laughs> Looks like Team Rocket's really blasting cool. off again. Bruh, absolutely brutal. <laughs> All right, Swaggins, what about you? What are your epic feats? Uh, I got a gun, a bunch of grease barrel, uh, grease files, and then basically laid them all out around the room, but in a way that if I threw explosives in the right what in the right place, it would break all of them. And then threw, got, climbed up, and then threw a smoke barrel, smoke powder barrel down on top of them, and then ended up burning every single enemy in the room to death with the with the combined explosion because we had a bard 
So I also killed the bard, but that's that's not important. <laughs> wow, goddamn. <laughs> well, I guess he really didn't like that Witcher show. <laughs> and then and then on top of that, we uh gnomes can't jump as far as other characters just cuz their size. Uh, me and my me and my cousin play this Baldur's Gate and he plays a gnome, a uh, sorcerer. So what I will do is I will throw him across to places where he can't be attacked except for with ranged. And he will just wreak havoc from that location. And that's super funny and fun. But it's not really wild. I mean, I guess it is sort of wild because it's kind of broken. But it's pretty funny. Okay. Well, gentlemen, um, I don't know when this is going to come out. I am not going to fucking lie to you. Based on my schedule, I might not even be the one who edits it. But, you know, it might be chance for some new up-and-comer or whoever I pay on Fiverr to shine. So, you know, I don't know when it's going to drop, but I am definitely looking forward to this video. And I'm definitely looking forward to figuring out how I'm going to play this game. There's so much weird shit surrounding it. Okay, so I haven't avoided it, but here's the weird thing for me. Number one, there is no crossplay yet. They announced they're making crossplay, but they don't know when they're going to make it, when it's going to be done. Why didn't you make it before the game came out? Also, obviously, the PC version and the console versions came out about a month apart from each other, right? So that means that my friend group is immediately segregated, which sucks because I legitimately want to play with all my homies. Not just because y'all have, you know, so many different OP builds, but because y'all have so many different approaches to how y'all build a character and just stupid shit you can do in game. So I'm a little bit torn, like Spider-Man choosing between Venom suit and the regular suit, if anyone remembers that old cartoon show. But, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But on top of that, um, my schedule is going to be clear enough to do it because I haven't bought uh, Jedi Last Survivor or whatever the new one is. I think it's Survivor. Yeah, I think that's the one. Yeah. I haven't bought Survivor, but I'm gonna. Um, I haven't bought uh, Baldur's Gate 3, but I'm gonna. And the only thing I'm waiting on is the new Sonic, which is going to take... It's like a six, seven hour game. It ain't going to take that long. And then I immediately go into Spider-Man 2. So honestly, I got time for it because going from this month all the way to February ain't shit in between. Not games aren't coming out, games I care about. Because like I said, once that Final Fantasy hit, you know, you might as well just inject that shit in my veins and put me in a coma because I don't think I'm going to leave my apartment for quite some time. They have team attacks like Chrono Trigger. They have a skill tree. They have alternate clothing outfits. That was everything I fucking wanted. Literally. That was specifically what I said I wanted in 2018 when we got the announcement. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, nice. unless they put in an offline or online co-op mode, I, 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 I am forbidden for asking for anything else. I'm mad we're not going to be able to play Vincent, though. But well, they should at least let us play Sid. At a bare minimum. I fucking love Sid. Oh, uh, yeah. I thought Vincent was unlockable by this point. But I guess they're going to put him somewhere else. Yeah, they what they did was they changed the order some events happened. Basically, they want you to get as much time with Aerith as possible. Yeah. Also, for anyone who thinks that's a spoiler, shut the absolute fuck up. Okay, I guess I mean, that's, that's like... Key. Yeah. Decades old by it's now. It's not even so. that. It's on shirts. It's memes <laughs> about it. Their entire YouTube... About Final Fantasy VII memes, where that shit comes up. Yeah. Well, whenever you uh, whenever you get around to picking up uh, Baldur's Gate three, if you would like uh, some companionship for your first run yes. through, I can give you the lay of the land and help you with understanding the system. Much appreciated, because I can tell you right now, I was probably going to be on PC. Um, I didn't plan on doing a lot of upgrades, but Black Friday's around the corner, so I'm probably going to be getting an 8K TV. And I know for a fact I'm going to be getting a computer that's going to have a Thunderbolt port that's going to let me use my, you know, graphic card enclosure. So whatever happens, something's getting upgraded in this bitch. With that being said, though, I will see you guys in the next ones. And I look forward to letting you guys know when the official video comes out. I will see you guys when I see you guys. Cool. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me, brother. Y'all have a good one. Catch you later. Bye.